questioning whether we should, in fact, be giving out child benefit to people on 70,000. In fact, you could have two people originally earning nearly 50,000 and uh, each, so they'd have 100,000 household income and getting it. Thanks to Sarah Devine, producer, Isla Theobalds, our assistant producer, Tech Op Dave Rhodes, of course, visual producer, Finley Knowles, he's been very quiet, Amin Asadi and Dan Warren at the desk for supporting such a great show, but more than anything else. Thank you to you all. Lively, loads of calls, fantastic content. Shall we do this all again? What should we say? Tomorrow, one o'clock. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Phelps, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
it's the ghost of Benjamin Disraeli. He says that this week on That Was The Woke That Was, Pete Barnes is going to be very rude to Ben <laughs> Habib because he's a communist. And Stephen Barrett and Lizzie Cundy are going to witness as well. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. As I said, a very packed show. Uh, and I love you, Nick Dubois, but this is a really different show because I'm looking at the exclusion or the lack of support for mental health in the budget. Um, I, I'm going to clap back against this idea that people just decide to become mentally ill or they're namby-pamby or they're wimps or they're not resilient. You know, I'm sorry, when we talk about this generation not being resilient or not being mamby-pamby and we point the finger at younger people, it's who the hell are their parents? Who screwed up? We did. If they're not resilient, if they're, all of these things are going on, instead of blaming younger people, we should look in our own backyard about parenting. It absolutely infuriates me when we wash our hands and we point our fingers at, 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 at youngsters coming up there, they're not this, they're not that. <laughs> people, we're the parents. How about we look at our own behaviour? when it comes to mental health and resilience. So we messed up and, and things happen like COVID and the world is a scarier place and the internet and social media that our generation invented. We mess this planet up and make people anxious about the environment. Okay, so we have failed. If, if, if that's what you're saying, we have failed the generation we are currently moaning about. And then we don't give any many money to mental health services. A mental illness is not something people choose. 99% of people don't choose to become, uh, have a mental health problem. Right? Let, let's get that straight, because I'm sick of the stigma people face when they have mental health problems. And I'm sorry, when you look at suicide figures, people taking their own lives, the biggest group of people taking their own lives in the UK are men aged over around about 35 to 50. Why? Because we stigmatise mental health. We don't allow people to admit their vulnerabilities to say, hey, I'm not coping in the early days so we can get in there and help them. And the, and the government's talking about why people aren't going back to work. Oh, there's a million people waiting for help on the mental health waiting list. We're going to be talking to um, somebody in the know about just that. Um, and also, when it comes to mental health, apparently there's a massive number, a large, large number of women who have mental health problems because of sexual abuse or familial abuse or something going wrong in the family. Uh, there's a new project out by Refuge. We're going to be talking about just that because yesterday was International Women's Day. That's where I'm, why I'm wearing purple. I've got purple and green in my earrings there. Uh, also, we'll be looking at the armed forces because the government is uh, talking about increasing the number of women from the current 11.5% to 30%. Uh, is it a right a right sort of environment for women to be uh, working in? We're going to be talking to somebody who was in the armed forces. A woman has written a book, which might just put you off. There's a lot going on. It's as I said before. It's International Women's Day yesterday. Today is Barbie's birthday. First sold on this day in 1959, invented by Ruth Handler. Uh, Mother's Day is tomorrow, and we'll be doing a special on that on our show tomorrow. Ramadan starts tomorrow night. The Oscars hosted by Jimmy Kimmel, that's tomorrow night. We'll be covering the Oscars. Uh, Monday is World Obesity Day. Next Sunday is St. Patrick's Day. Easter starts the week at that. After that, there's a lot going on, isn't there? A lot going on. Uh, so we will be talking also about policing by drones. Um, the test place is Moyol Stomping Ground in Norfolk. 
I guess because it's a rural area. San Diego's already been trialing it. We'll be talking about uh, that in all things tech. I'm going to try and get hold of somebody in San Diego, actually, because they've got experience of drones going out instead of police. Does it work? Doesn't it work? Um, and also, headlines are screaming. London has become a no-go zone for Jews. There's a really interesting um, history on the use of no-go zones and how it's used politically to pit people against each other. You know what I do on my show. We we bring in the voices that politicians don't want you to hear. They don't get votes from people coming together. They get votes from divide and conquer. So... Yeah, I'm going to do my little bit to to change that. Uh, as always, though, starting off the show is our wonderful Jonathan Liss, our political commentator, who joins me now. Jonathan, sorry, I had a bit of a rant and rave there at the beginning because I do get ticked off when people dismiss mental health and and dump on the younger generations being lonely, lazy, and all that sort of thing. With, with the parents, if they are. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah, and, and where young people are, you know, obviously uh, facing problems that their parents never face. You know, what I find, and there was a, there was a viral clip going around Twitter this week, Trisha, of um, some people in their sixties, um, sort of lamenting about the younger generation about how they need to all the cliches about lattes and avocado toast. And then the interviewer okay. asked them how much they paid for their first house, and they said, "Well, five thousand pounds, ten thousand pounds." So, you know, um, there is sort of a, a disconnect in how we see young people and how difficult it's going to be for people my age and sort of much younger as well to sort of get a start in life um, when they're just simply not going to have the opportunities and the assets um, that came so easily um, to their parents and their parents. Well, it was relatively easy. I mean, they earned a lot less, I've got to say that, but I think the world was a less scary place. Um, you know, you had to wait for the newspapers to come out. It wasn't constantly being updated. Um, the rhetoric has got more divisive as well. Politics has become more of a game. And there are a whole load of things that were, are happening now that weren't happening. And I, I'm in my 60s, but I can I look at what young people are going through. And like I said, it, it, we couldn't, as parents, prepare them for the world today because we didn't even know, you know, look at the, look how the world has changed so quickly. But I just get very cross when we dump on young people when we're the parents. Anyway, talking about older generations i think to me the big news this week one of the big news uh, headlines was theresa may uh has decided to stand down at the general election um i thought it was interesting that she actually talked about this in the maidenhead advertiser rather than go to the national press i think that was really classy of her well you know, I'm not a big fan of Theresa May, as is on, is on public record, um, but one thing you can say about her is that she is committed to um, her constituency. By all accounts, she is um, a good constituency MP. Uh, and so that sort of um, is in keeping with that, that she would make an announcement uh, to her local paper. She also put it on Twitter afterwards. Uh, I don't think she's ever composed a tweet herself in her life, but uh, it was put on her official Twitter account by somebody. Uh, and so, you know, that's sort of like run out of nice things to say about Theresa May very quickly, Trish, I'm afraid. I've never been a fan, shall we say. Uh, and I, well, what I really I resent I about Theresa May <laughs> is this whitewashing of her legacy and this rehabilitation, which began pretty much as soon as she left office. There is nothing to rehabilitate. So much of the mess that we find ourselves in, uh, the mess of Brexit, um, the mess of the, the anti-immigration uh, sort of policies and rhetoric uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, some of the, a lot of the extremism in the Conservative Party started under her, and the radicalization of the Conservative Party was not only stars on her, but it was actively encouraged by her because it suits her po politically at the time. It suits her and um, the Conservative Party to be whipped up into a frenzy, uh, which fanned out across the, the right-wing media landscape over Brexit, and as mm -hmm. such about um, the rise of treason, uh, betrayal. We heard Theresa May talk about betrayal all the time when things would, when people discuss 
keeping the single market, something which even the Brexiters used to talk about in the 90s. That was somehow cast as betrayal. Theresa May has never been held accountable for the way that she ramped up the rhetoric. She took what was a 52-48 decision. Um, to, she disenfranchised millions of voters by refusing to break any kind of compromise whatsoever and taking that debate to a total extreme um, that we are still suffering the effects of and will be for many years to come. And that's obviously before we get to the horrendous legacies over Windrush, over the hostile environment, yeah. over go home bans, over bowing and scraping before Donald Trump, for God's sake, asking that man um, on a state visit um, in the desperate and forlorn hope for a trade deal which was never going to come and completely humiliating and degrading us and the Queen in the process. All these things were unforgivable, but Theresa May has very cleverly been able to rise above the prey and cast herself as some kind of elder statesperson just because she's slightly less dire than the three dire people who replaced her. What about Tony Blair? You're talking about sucking up to the Americans. I mean, do, do you think when you compare Theresa May to, to Tony Blair or, you know, who, who would you compare her to in Labour? Well, look, George Bush was a, a pretty obscene man in many ways, but he wasn't Donald Trump. Uh, and no. look, I'm, I, and I think that also, look, I think there are, there are valid points to be made here, and I'm not here to defend Tony Blair, of course. Uh, what Tony right. Blair did in foreign policy was pretty indefensible in many ways, and as was his sick fancy towards George Bush, which was also very cringe-making at the time, uh, particularly in the, the one-sided relationship. And, you know, Tony Blair did not have to follow George Bush all the way to the butchery in Iraq. He chose to do that, and he should be held accountable for that as well. And, you know, other, some people might argue he has been, not in the way they might like, but he has been in terms of legacy. Um, yeah. Donald Trump didn't uh, wage any new war in the Middle East, so for that we can be grateful. But I don't think that we can um, somehow exonerate him in any other way. And the way that Theresa May behaved, the total sycophancy that she showed, so the the, um, the scrambling to be the first um, foreign leader to, to welcome him to, down to, to the White House after, he, uh, after the inauguration, was just extremely embarrassing and, and, and not how other allies treated Donald Trump, which was um, with uh, it's a very careful distance, which is what Trump needed because he was a danger and still is. Have you not got one good word? Is there not? I mean, she's done a lot for modern slavery, and that's what she's saying she's she's going to con uh, concentrate on. Um, can you not think of anything that she might have done? I mean, she was a prominent figure in leading the international condemnation in response to Russia over the poisoning of uh, Sergei and Yule Skripal in March 2018. Well, that happened in nothing... the UK. Of course she had to take the lead on that. Yeah, she so is there no... nothing positive you can say about her? <laughs> um, she... Like, honestly, I, I look, there might be look, there might be individual examples of Theresa May not being a disaster, but it was completely overshadowed by the legacy of failure um, that she that she landed us with. And I think that has to be the main story rather than just picking out individual bits of legacy. And the other thing I would say, Trisha, is that as a backbencher, she stood up in Parliament and made decent speeches, it has to be said in opposition to government policy. And then 90% of the time, she then either votes with the government or abstains. She doesn't put her words into action, just like when she stood up on Downing Street, um, when she came into office in 2016, and she gave quite a commendable speech about the just about managing and how, you know, the black people um, had um, sort of complete sort of systemic disadvantages compared to white people. And what did she do about that? Absolutely nothing. All right, Jonathan. Jonathan does not like Theresa May. Um, OK, let's talk about the budget. Now, um, the response, I'm, I, well, we've, uh, later on in the programme, we're going to be talking about, to me, um, I'm very ticked off that the government uh, talked the talk, but when it comes to mental health, no extra money there. We're going to be talking about the effect of that. Um, but voters back budget, more pessimistic about the economy a year ago. Uh, there seems to be, and then non-DOMs aren't happy. I mean, people don't usually speak about um, budgets in glowing terms, but uh, do you think from the headlines, uh, what is the feedback the headlines are giving from uh, Conservatives when it comes to the budget? 
Look, there's a, a very, very simple story in politics right now, Cheshire. It's been there for a long time and it will continue until the election. And that is the British people have made up their minds. Nothing is going to change their minds. Um, the only thing that can happen is that they hate the Conservatives a little bit more every time something goes wrong. So the Conservatives can, can deliver a budget which is not unpopular, um, obviously, some pensioners won't be happy about it, and a lot of people shouldn't be happy about it, by the way, because of the, of the fiscal drag, which means that even with our sort of two-p cut in national insurance, which is all they were talking about in the pub, by the way, on Wednesday, um, that people are still going to be dragged into um, paying more tax because of this uh, fiscal drag, which means that thresholds are not rising, and that with inflation, more and more people are going to be dragged into tax um, altogether, and then into higher tax brackets as well. So that will undo any tax cuts and that's very unfair and that was not always the case the 1970s thresholds of rise in inflation that was written into law that's no longer the case um so so people might not have been displeased about the budget but even if they might have liked individual bits of it it's not going to be enough to turn the conservative fortunes that's the bottom line talking about people on the way out just a real quick hit gary goldsmith this is uh, <laughs> the touch this is gary goldsmith becomes the first star to leave celebrity big brother he was apparently welcomed by booze he talked about uh, he's the brother of uh, kate's uh, mother carol middleton um the women's groups didn't like the fact that he was in the brother house at all because as we know in the past he was done for domestic violence uh, he says he's a reformed man. He should have been given another chance. Uh, he dropped. A, he didn't say anything amazing about the royal Catherine or what have you. Um, but you know, it seems to have made the headlines. Well, look, everyone got something out of it, didn't they? ITV um, got uh, publicity. Uh, he um, got a handy paycheck. The only people who would have hated it are. Um, Kate and William, of course. Uh, though I can't, I'd have loved to be a fly on the wall at Kensington Palace when the news of his uh, entry into Big Brother was announced. I'm sure they're very relieved that he's been kicked out. Yes, I'm sure it acted in the way that an, an, an enema never would have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a polite way of saying it. Jonathan, um, you, you've had a really old moan today, but never mind. We talk. <laughs> don't get me started on Theresa May next time, and then we'll be fine. <laughs> right, old moan you are. I have to bring up some happy headlines. I'll try and find some happy headlines next time we have you on. Jonathan List there, our political commentator. I'm sure you'll have lots to say. Maybe you were a fan of Theresa May. Uh, did you watch Big Brother? I don't know. Uh, we've got lots more to talk about. We're going to be talking on a, on a serious note, as I mentioned there, um, with uh, Big Brother and what have you, and Kate Middle, uh, Kate Catherine, um, Catherine, uh, her uncle, and how women's groups had uh, came out. One woman criticised him being included because he had been done for domestic violence in the past. Uh, International Women's Day, as I said, was yesterday. Um, and, and here's to tie mental health in towards this. Abuse is the main driver of mental ill health in women and girls, and that's according to psychiatrists and a finding from a survey. Uh, there's a number on the screen because you might want to have a talk about mental health. Do you think it's all? Am I wrong in getting a little bit cross when people say, ah, you know, write off mental health and what have you. We just write off physical health. It's just a broken arm. Get over it. You know, um, what are your thoughts on that? 0344-499-1000. You can text the word TALK to 8722. You can exit TALK TV. Just sort of my question of the day. Do you think that more politicians need to to recognize mental illness and mental health and do something about it or do you just think it's it, it's people making excuses so uh, my poor old producers have got to find up a, a, a way to put that on screen but i'm basically asking you mental illness isn't an excuse is it real are we doing enough about it Oh three double four four nine nine one thousand. You can phone or you can WhatsApp. You can text the word talk to eight seven triple two. You can X at Talk TV. Um, I, I just think that when, it's a dangerous way, a path we go down, writing off mental illness per se, 
or mental ill health is a spectrum you can become anxious and then if nothing's done about it whoops you fall into mental health just like physical health really i think it's a dangerous path a dangerous uh, furrow we plow if we write that off because it means people don't get help early enough and as i said when it comes to taking your life it's older men who are way up there Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, to put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Oh, well, my good, good. My rant about mental health got you going. Because we need to, nobody talks about it. Um, mental health. Hi, Trisha, I have schizophrenia and have had to go to food banks and fi uh, until I finally got PIPs. You are a great advocate for us all. That's Graham in Bradford. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Uh, mental health. Hello, lovely Trisha. Me again. Can't wait for Saturday afternoon. Mental health. Quite right. You go, girl. That's Sally. Mwah, to both of you. Um, got some people online to talk about mental health. Um, I think this is Buck in Sheffield. Hello. What What Hello. did you want to say? Hi. Yeah, I'd just like to say that people I know, yeah, yeah. are using mental mental health as a reason not to go to work. I won't say somebody you in say... the NHS, quite high up, was, right. like she said, was talking to some of the, she had a day, she was talking to some of the mothers down at school, and it worked out that they were £300 a week, a month, that's it often she was. Well, so hang on, hang on, hang on. Doing? Before you say people you know are using mental health, 
What yeah. do you mean? Are they saying they can't work and they have yeah. a, de de a, 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 a um, they've been prescribed with a mental illness or uh, well, can you just tell me about that? Yeah, put it this way. You just go down to the doctors. I'm suicidal. I've got depression. I've got this. I've got that. I've got the other. These people are all quite, you know, the, the two I know, because they work with my wife, are, are quite senior staff in the oh, okay, NHS. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I never forget an interview with Margaret Thatcher and they interview a guy called George Neger said people say these people say and she said which people so I'm going to say I'm not without naming them because we've all heard stories of people go in and say I'm suicidal I'm this that and the other but are you talking about a specific person do you know what their their met what's happening in their personal lives for a fact do you yes. know what happened in their past for a yes. fact yeah. So all of that, and you they've had been perfectly happy, you're saying they've never had any problems whatsoever because you've got the whole details of their personal life and they are, this particular person is using mental illness as, as a way not to go to work. Is that what you're saying? I am, yes. Now, the, like you say, these people, yes, these two right. ladies I know, were both senior staff in the hospitals. So believe right. in me, they know the routine. And when, like one, like one of the ladies came round to have a cup of tea with my, with my wife, because my wife knew her when she was a student, right. when she was a student, and she said, "I work. Why should I work Friday nights, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, Christmas, New Year, Bank Holiday?" Yeah. 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 When somebody down the some other people down the road. A three hundred pound a month better off in two years, and not working. Why? I, I get your I get your point, but uh, uh, and uh, I've got loads of calls waiting. I get your point. There are always going to be somebody along the line who bucks the system, but we when we start making blanket statements and 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 just listening to you, I hate to say it, but it's men your age group who are taking their lives more than any other age group. So we've got to be really really careful thank thank you for that oh three double four four nine nine one thousand uh uh i've got another message here i messaged before with my story but would like to say again thank you for speaking out for us blokes who suffer with mental health i tried to take my life with the train oh yeah i remember you and you are still here you're still fighting um but luckily i'm still here how i how ill do people want me to be before they believe that mental health is a, a real issue? Please keep up the good fight. That's Stephen in York. Stephen, I will. I will. Because I was a mental health advisor in Australia for 10 years. I was a member of the World Psychiatric Association and travelled all over the world looking at mental health. I've worked with groups. I've worked as a, as a patron and an ambassador for mind mental health. I have worked actually with mental health groups and in the community in areas where I'm not a Trisha, I'm just another person who's a mental health uh, volunteer. And I can tell you for every one person I might have met who's mental, who might have been playing it up a little bit, I'm not saying they didn't have anxiety, for every one person I've got to say there's probably 5,000, no, I exaggerate, probably 100, 200 more who really, really could have done with some help and it wasn't there. Um, we have who have we got arthur in leeds arthur hello what did you want to say about mental health have you got arthur hello i don't think we have we lost we seem to have lost arthur in in, in mental health um but uh let, let's move on now but there's oh have we got arthur hello arthur hello what did you want yeah. to say oh uh, can you hear me I can, darling. What did you want to say? Oh, good. You're one of my favourites. Uh, 25 years ago, um, uh, 25 years ago, I was out shopping, supermarket, and suddenly I said to myself, what am I doing here? And I dropped the basket, and I rushed to St. James Hospital, uh, half a mile away, and I told the right. doctor, I was scared I might do something silly. Right. And... And then they took me by taxi to Hyde Lloyd's Hospital, Menston, and I was sat down drinking a cup of tea. And all of a sudden, I got this emptiness in my brain, which was unbearable. 
it was it was worse than stepping a knife me ten times. I laid on my back and I screamed and screamed, and they gave me an injection. And then four weeks later, I, I went home, and I think it was my brain telling me that I had nothing to live for. Now Gary Speed, the Leeds United footballer, he played football for Leeds all his life, and then he retired. He became, became their manager. And then he retired, and then a few weeks later, he hung himself. And I think well, you're he may be the same as what happened to me, that entrance in your brain, which I've never heard of before. Because Arthur, it, Arthur, it and so you went through that, or Arthur, you went through that awful, awful, awful experience, and it makes it so much harder when people say, oh, you're just mucking about, you're just making it up. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for calling in. I'm, I'm really sorry you went through that. So there are hundreds of thousands of Arthurs and uh, out there who, and Arthur, Arthur just, you know, you don't choose to have these things. But when people do not believe what you're going through or belittle what you're going through, it makes it so much worse. 0344 You can text the word talk to 87222. You can X at talk TV. Um, Talking about when people don't believe what you're going through uh, and mental health, the two together. Now, as I said before, um, abuse is a huge, it's the main driver of mental ill health in women and girls, according to psychiatrists. This was a survey of UK practitioners, abuse and violence. So, you know, there you are. It, it comes up again. Now, yesterday was International Women's Day uh, and Refuge have a brilliant um, new initiative that you may well be able to get involved with. It's called We See You. It's a new survivor-focused art mosaic in collaboration with artist Helen Marshall, uh, founder of People's Picture. Uh, joining me now is Louise Firth, who's the Director of Fundraising and Communications at Refuge. Um, Louise, I, I, I brought together mental health and uh, domestic abuse and women, you know, of, which is not just physical, it can be emotional, and the entire range, because the the two are very closely interrelated, are they not? Hi, Trisha, nice to see you. Um, absolutely, I think that um, women who experience abuse, domestic abuse, whether that's emotional, psychological, or physical, or sexual violence, um, often that's hugely traumatic, and, and often they will have uh, mental health um challenges as a result of that yeah yes let's come back to uh, this whole thing of people not being believed because it, it crops up time and time again when uh people have, have suffered from abuse speaking out not being believed or not wanting to speak out because they don't think people will believe them yeah, you're right. Within society, there's a huge stigma still around abuse. So we know that it's so um, such a huge issue today. One in four women are affected of domestic abuse at some point in their lifetime. And in England and Wales, two women a week on average are killed by their partner or former partner. So this is a really serious issue, but still women are not believed. So we are here to say we believe you and we will listen um, and yeah, reach, reach out to us, reach out to someone that, that you trust when you can, because you're not alone. That's that's the key message we want to say to to women is that there is there is help available, um, and hopefully you can you can find it. Find yeah, because I was going to say a lot of women are scared of speaking out because they think they're who they are will be put on trial. You know, it's the woman's history that's put out there. It's it's the woman who's being examined to see basically if she's some, you know, a, a, a gorgeous little virgin, if I can put it like that. When that has nothing to do with it, you could be a sex worker, you could be a nun, you could be a schoolgirl, you could be a housewife, you could be anyone, and it's not about how you dress, it's not about where you are, it's not about all of those things. There's a, a lot of stereotypes around uh, 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 women being abused, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely, and it all links back to within our society, there is an imbalance of power between men and women, and that is, you know, misogyny and, and the patriarchy, and what we're trying to do through this project and through our work is celebrate the amazing resilience and strength 
that women have in the face of that kind of persistent patri patriarchal attitudes. So yeah, we need women to be able to, to speak up, but obviously we want the, to prevent the abuse from happening in the first time. And, and you're right, what, what you've described is victim blaming. So people are, you know, women are put under such scrutiny when actually it should be the perpetrators of abuse who are scrutinized. Um, you know, often there's a, there's a myth around why didn't she leave? Well, actually the question should be, why has he been doing this? Why have he been perpetrating the abuse? And it is overwhelmingly men that perpetrate the, perpetrate the abuse and it is overwhelmingly women who are the victims and survivors. Just before we come to the actual project, because we, I, I want to tell people how they can get involved. Uh, Gary Goldsmith, you know, um, Catherine, um, her, her uh, um, Carol Middleton, her mum's brother, was in the Big Brother house. And one organisation, women's organisation, has actually questioned whether he should have been in there because he has a past of, and he was convicted in the court of violence uh, against a woman. What do you say to that? If somebody says, look, that was me there, I've rehabilitated myself, I've changed and gives excuses, is does that fly with you? Or once somebody has um, been violent against a woman, that's it? Thank you for, for bringing it up because, yeah, you're right, Refuge also called that out. And we think that is just inappropriate. You're platforming a perpetrator, someone who has convicted a crime, and I just think there are plenty of other people who could have had that that spot, but you're glorifying giving someone who's committed, you know, guilt to, as, as charged with domestic abuse charges. Um, why celebrate them and, and platform them when there are, you know, millions of other people out there who could have had that opportunity? Ah, thank you. Thank you for that. So let's tell people how they can get involved in this project uh because we've also got um a, a way people can do that we can put that up on the screen it's called we see you explain to me what that is how people can get involved so yeah absolutely we are there to celebrate that that strength and the resilience of women and not only you know survivors but also the people around them whether it's a frontline worker whether it's a friend, a family member. So you can submit a photo of your of yourself if you if you're a survivor or of, of your yeah of your loved one or, or someone close to you. We're also really conscious that you know sometimes it might not be safe to you know be fully identifiable. So there are different ways you can take a photo of your eye or your hand, or you might like one of those um, avatars where you're sort of you know cartoonified. Um, so di different ways in which you can, um, yeah, submit a, submit a photo to celebrate. And that's going to be built into this big mosaic, this big mural, um, which will be unveiled later this year. And it will be a really exciting chance to, to celebrate. I love these, these pieces of work and Helen's done a great job. So head to the website, the people's picture. You can just click and easily upload a, a photo. People's picture. Pic people's picture. Go online, <laughs> click. Yeah, click upload what you, an image of yourself. As you said, it could be an eye, it could be a hand, it could be an avatar, but it's to represent your resilience that that these women are still with us. Thank you so much for uh, for that input, um, Louise Firthler, Director of Fundraising and Communications at Refuge, talking about We See You, a, an amazing new project. And remember, you can get involved if you have an experience if you work with people who've been domestically abused you've been uh, abused yourself or you're a family member get involved get involved uh we'll be back with more after this Hey, very good morning to you thanks for joining us you're with talk tv on tv on radio online and we're on your smart speaking now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. So many of your phone calls. I really want to take them. I'm going to be uh, putting in a slot in about, mm, I'm going to say about 15 minutes. I'm going to be taking your call. So hang on there. Uh, mental health. Hi, Trish. I have so much stigma due to my mental health. I have post-traumatic stress disorder, but I have not been in the military. It's a different type of trauma. Nevertheless, trauma. I agree. People do not understand at all. And most health professionals don't know how to deal with trauma. Uh, Theresa May. Oh, God, I was talking about that with Jonathan Lissy and to say. Uh, we should look for the good in all. I think we'd all like to do the same for us. Sometimes our opinions are clouded by personal relationships or political persuasion. I'm none of these, so what I liked about Theresa May was a happy little jig and how she went along hand in hand with Donald Trump when he made that gesture towards her. It was a sign of humility on both sides. Oh, I don't know if it was on Donald Trump. Um, I don't know many who would do that, and I don't know how many people would hold Donald Trump's hand anyway. Um, somebody's hand who I definitely would hold is my next guest because the Oscars are tomorrow night. And Steve Denyer, who else can you speak to about the Oscars? Except for the wonderful Virgin Radio presenter, Steve Denyer, who joins us in the studio in London. Steve, so many things to rattle through. Now, first of all, the Razzie Awards. That's always a bit of a hoot. Who got that? Yeah, so the, the Razzie is, is kind of the, the, the Raspberry Awards. And this has been going since 1981. They usually do this the night before the Oscars ceremony. So this takes place tonight. And Trisha, oh. just think the worst movies ever made. I mean, so many of these movies that have been nominated, I've never heard of rarely get to actually play at the cinema. There is... Um, uh, let, let me start with this one movie. This seems to be nominated for everything. It's uh, Can you believe this? Hold tight. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. It's Winnie the Pooh turned into a horror movie. I've got, <laughs> I've got a little bit to play you. It's really bad. Heads up. Please, to be friends, why are you doing this, please? I would have never left that planet, I swear.
that wasn't the that wasn't the version that my parents used to tell me when I was like four or five. I think I'd watch for a, for a, a, a laugh, but that's what that's up for a Razzie or yeah. Has so that... it's up for everything. The worst picture, the worst director, basically the worst everything, the worst concept. I could go on and on and on. It, it just keeps it keeps popping up. Uh, every single winner gets the statue itself. It's kind of a golf ball sized raspberry with. Um, a film reel at the top but it's it's fun it's been going since 1981 now the oscars this is all eyes on the oscars that goes on tomorrow evening for the first time in the uk the oscars is going to be shown on a terrestrial channel so you get this on itv you have to stay up very late the action starts at around I'm working it out. It must be like 3 a.m. So I get up really early to do my Virgin Radio show. So all, all the all the big awards will be breaking around kind of 5 a.m., um, 6 a.m. UK time. Um, we've spoken about this Oppenheimer up for tons this year. Um, also Barbie, but my own personal favourite. I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's possibly the most messed up, bizarre film. It's Emma Stone in... Oh, poor thing. Poor things. Yes, I've got... Can I just show you a tiny, right. tiny bit? All right, yeah, it's a bit Marmite, isn't it? This is Bella. Ba, ba. Ah. Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Hello, Bella. No. She's an experiment. Good evening. Her brain and her body are not quite synchronised. But she's progressing at an accelerated pace. Where did she come from? I shall. So you're completely right, Trisha. It is absolutely, it's Marmite. But the, the really interesting thing is, all the people I know that have seen it, that didn't like it, some hated it, have all had yeah. so much to say about it. And it kind of resonates with you. That it's so messed up that a week later, I was still trying to, trying to process what, I, what I'd what i seen. It is very clever. It's almost kind of AI generated. But Emma Stone, the acting, is out of this world. I was so, so impressed. Right. I think that's a movie that you... I don't advocate using drugs, but perhaps they might help with that one. Um, <laughs> now, uh, moving on to look at showbiz. Yeah. Bad... He, he, he's uh, the rapper. He sued a fan for filming his concert. Now... People do that all the time, but so this is this is serious. It's a serious precedent. This is really interesting, and I don't know. I don't think we've spoken about this before. I don't know what you think about this. I've got a, a personal bugbear of people filming concerts because I always think you, what's, you're really going to be what you're really going to watch that handheld shaky footage in four years time you've paid probably quite a hefty price to see a gig just enjoy it you know look at the action in front of you but this guy not only filmed the whole concert but he's been uploading whole songs onto his youtube page so what bad bunnies said which is a great name it's a name that i would like to be called at the weekends uh what bad bunnies said is he's going to sue this person one hundred and fifty thousand dollars her song unless this person takes it off his um, YouTube page. So it sets a, it's interesting because when I went, I, I went to see somebody, I think it was Madonna five years ago. And as you went wow. in on this particular concert, they confiscated your phone. They put it into a seal tight kind of envelope and numbered it. And then you picked it up after the gig obviously if you go to bigger kind of arena shows they can't do that there's like 10,000 people there uh what do you think about it about people filming um, I like to get into the mood I can understand just filming a little bit but I don't understand why you'd film whole songs yeah. and, and, and what have you I I just don't get that because yeah. usually you can find it on a bit of the concert on YouTube or something like that yeah so to me, I just like to get into the mood. I might just film a little bit to say, oh, look, I went. Yeah, like the uh, opening is always good, isn't it? The big kind of, the you know, when the lights go off and the spectacular opening, I think that always looks really good and it gets loads of Instagram likes if you ever put that on, but not not the whole not the whole show. I mean, I went to a show recently and someone had an iPad. Do you know? And I thought, oh. come on, come on, come get on. <laughs> get out. Um, right, pop history has been made in LA because Kylie and Madonna. This Kylie is amazing. This is amazing. So I've been a fan of both of these. Uh, I think every fan, I think every fan has waited for thirty years. Every time Madonna goes on tour and Kylie's in the same place, there's always a rumor. But this 
happened last night in Los Angeles. Take a little look at this. Anyway, it's a feeling for me to be up here singing with you. You're a fighter too. God bless you. Never give up. You never do. So this is Madonna's celebration tour and this was the night that's actually being filmed so they're going to film it, they're going to stream the concert at the end of the year. But what a special moment. I mean, both of them have been through so much. Madonna said last night on this show she nearly passed away last summer uh, when she had yeah, that bacterial yeah. infection. Of course, Kylie um, managed to... Yes, of course. That was, um, you know, roughly 20 years ago. They are both fighters aren't they and it was international women's day and this happened and every single person at the kia forum in la i'm so jealous of you because i <laughs> <laughs> really special moment a really special pop moment see what's a combined age there i mean madonna's my age or she's coming up for 60 i uh, was 66 yes Ky Kylie's mid 50. I think she's 56. Certainly mid 50s, I go with Kylie. So that is that is about, I'd go for 130. <laughs> Maybe. Well, yeah, listen, that's a hot 130. Yes. I mean, that's a hot 130. Uh, TV tonight, Texas night. Uh, it's tonight on BBC Two. Yeah, Charlene Spateri, who's always here at Virgin Radio, really good friends with Chris Evans, uh, an amazing singer. She used to be a hairdresser in Glasgow, and then she, she got uh, kind of noticed in the band Texas. They, they will show you, part of this is all the, her BBC appearances over the years, they'll show you her first performance in 1989 on Top of the Pop singing a song called uh, Don't Want to Be Your Lover, and it's, it's, she's so young. It's incredible. What a career, though. All these years later, there's a really nice little bit after the, uh, the Texas at the BBC. They're showing uh, Texas Live with the Force... Uh, with the full orchestra. Um, so she oh. really can see she's got a most amazing voice. There's about three hours of stuff tonight on BBC Two to watch out for, and that starts at 8.35 later. Orchestral movement, movement, what is it, in the dark, O2 City Hall? Yeah, so they were, They used to be called orchestral manoeuvres in the dark, and then they realised that none of us could say the name. So then they started... <laughs> <laughs> then they were like, just call us OMD. Uh, but yeah. two guys, they met each other in primary school, uh, these two, and they had massive hits in the 80s. They then kind of split, came back for a bit in the 90s, and are now there are so many 80s bands are going back on tour because the 80s is really hot again. People love it. You know, it's quite dark times we live in. People love to be reminded of simpler, you know, more fun, more fun times. So they are doing uh, City Hall in Newcastle. And Feeder, the rock band that gave us the legendary song Buck Rogers, which is brilliant, makes you feel amazing. Uh, their feeder were named after Grant, the lead singer's pet goldfish, and they're still going 30 years on. They started in, you know, that whole kind of Britpop era in the 90s. They're on tonight in uh, the Great Hall in Cardiff. So a couple of different bands, a couple of different places around the UK, but probably well worth going to if you can uh, get a ticket. Um, I wondered if I could be cheeky, Trisha. It's very right. cheeky of me, but I wanted to plug my own show um, next week because I'm on Virgin Radio 80s Plus every afternoon. And we have oh, the idea is we have a different guest on every week and they pick their favourite songs from the 80s. We've had Kim Wilde's been on all this week. But next week, it's Tony Hadley from Spandau Ballet, who um, he, he, he's such a lovely guy, such a lovely man, so down to earth. He's got all these I sort of. Say that again. Go. Gold, no. yeah, gold, true. He was a uh, band aid. He was backstage. He was on Live Aid. He told me this story backstage at Live Aid, hanging out with Freddie Mercury. And I asked him this about his friendship with Freddie Mercury. And, you know, he lived with him and, well, he, he obviously knew him and lived through that whole AIDS horrible, you know, chapter. Have a little look at this. Freddie was, Freddie was. He gave me sort of, sort of mentored me um, a little bit as a young singer. How was that period for you, knowing that one of your, you know, like one of your yeah. mates, one of your colleagues, as it were, yeah. was going through such a bad time? It's such an awful time if you had AIDS. And... Terribly sad. And I remember the last time I saw Fred was Fred with Montserrat Caballé, and, and Fred was there. And I remember saying, "Hi, Fred, how are you doing?" And he looked. He looked, he'd lost a lot of weight. Yeah. And I went to give him a hug and he said, are you sure? And I said, Fred, shut up. Just 
just one of those stories that I, I was just absolutely in awe uh, of Tony Hadley. He's lived through that whole period. Uh, those people were his colleagues, really, you know? Um, so every song he plays next week, he, he's known the artist. He's got cracking stories about all of them. So we're going to do it at 4.30 p.m., Monday to Friday on Virgin Radio 80s Plus. It's a really good listen. So thank you for letting me talk about that. Oh, that's brilliant, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, Frank, thank you for being part of the show and catching us up on all things showbiz, including the Oscars. Let me tell you what's coming up. We have our legal eagle, uh, Joseph Cotri Monson, talking about the laws you might not know about. For instance, you can be done for having a leaky tap and not fixing it or not wiping the snow off your windscreen. All of those laws and others you might be breaking are technical roundup as well. Drones instead of police, it's something that they're talking about trialing in Norfolk they already do it in San Diego but what's the tech issues behind that and of course lots of your calls 0344 499 1000 you can text the word talk to 8732 or you can x at talk tv uh and it's all about my rant and rave about mental health are we taking it seriously enough is the question uh lots more to come right after this so stay with me here I'm such a god of course let's talk TV back in this is talk TV three two one uh, go this my friends is talk today with me Jeremy Kyle and me Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to fail her. Oh, yes, supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
it's the ghost of Benjamin Disraeli. He says that this week on That Was The Woke That Was, Pete Barnes is going to be very rude to Ben <laughs> Habib because he's a communist. And Stephen Barrett and Lizzie Cundy are going to witness as well. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> Uh, let me tell you what's coming up in this next hour. All things technical with Will Guyatt. We're going to be looking at the uh, trialling, the uh, obscene amount of money, I'm going to use that uh, word, uh, to trial drones uh, in Norfolk. Um, it's already been trialled in um, in San Diego. You can actually turn drones into killer drones as well. Oh, yeah, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, plus, there's a big war going between the clergy and wedding photographers because apparently wedding photographers keep getting in the way and the clergy want to do their job. There was actually a couple of weeks ago, 900 wedding photographers wrote an open letter complaining about this. So we're going to be talking about that with a photographer. Uh, my rant and rave right at the beginning of the show, though, was about mental health. I get very touchy when people write off mental health because oh, everybody's, you know, they're pretending they're just trying to get out of work because, as I said before, here's a fact. One in four of us at some stage in our life, and this is a very conservative estimate, one in four of us will go through a mental health issue so severe we'll need to seek help for it. However, <laughs> you know, the, the government, it kind of ignored that. And they know this. They know this. I've been part of working with the King's Fund in bef uh, before I got the very proud to receive the President's uh, Medal in 2011 from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Let me tell you, they know. They know. But nothing is being done about it. People write it off. One in four of us will have an issue. Um, so my question to you, is: should we just keep calm and carry on? Or is it a real issue? Uh, online now is um, Dave in Durham. He rang in. Dave, hi, what did you want to say about mental health? Do we have Dave in Durham? We do, yes. Ah, hello. What did you want to say, Dave? Well, I got married as a, as a young man about 17, 18, and my wife was five years older than me. Yeah. And we were scraping on trying to make a living in them days. And I just said to my wife, I said, I'm going to start my own business. Right. But short, shortly after, oh, hello, we lost you. I hope we haven't lost so you. Shortly after, um, she got him to see me. Uh, Twelve years later, right. So that left the business on me, the children on me, and yeah. I didn't want to live in the same house again. That's why oh. I moved to Durham. Right. So mental health doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And PTSD. It does. But you got to be. You got to be very careful. In, going to give it to so you're it, 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 i'm you went through a very very tough time it sounds like um yeah. and my point is that when people don't believe you or think you're making it up it makes it even worse yes well i i carried on working after my wife died only only for about five years right but i couldn't i couldn't live in the same house I understand that. I, I, the grief and the memories, um, yeah. all of those things. Did you get help? Did you did you get help or did no, you just I kind of... For help. I didn't go for help, no. So what I done was rented my house out and uh, I had a manager working for me, so he, he was doing all the transport, right. run, running the trucks, running the vans and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And I just move around the country. Then I thought one day I've got to do something about this. Yeah. So I just thought. So I've, I've packed the business in. Right. And I thought, where do I want to go? I thought I'll go to County Durham. Right. And I've and I've been up here. Oh, yeah. 
So do you do you ever talk to anybody? I mean, you're talking to me about this. Do you ever sit down and actually talk to somebody? Do you talk about your emotions? Or, you know, there's a, a, a lot of people feel they can't because they might be seen as weak. I No, I talk to my two kids. Good. Good. Because they still you. down like birds in that area. Yeah. But I'm up to County Durham. All right. Thank, thank you. I want to thank you for calling in and talking to me because often these things are very difficult to talk about and grief you're absolutely right grief does uh, often give people uh, all sorts of feelings it brings up all sorts of feelings in them um let me read you a message here uh to the, uh, and please do contact me uh the number is on the screen oh three double four four nine nine one thousand i'm going to take another call in a minute hi lovely trisha re mental health yes i don't think enough is done about this debilitating condition what really upsets me are people who have ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder when we have soldiers especially who are living on the streets with ptsd because of what they've seen and what's happened to them and then migrants living in nice hotel with food and warmth and three meals a day i have to say lots of those most of those have ptsd because of what they've seen and what they've gone through uh i see they fought for their country and for what the government are a total disgrace allowing this any mental illness should be taken extremely uh, seriously i agree with you penny in essex mental health uh we're talking about lorraine in birmingham is online lorraine hello what what did you want to talk about um, yeah, when people actually, I know like mental health, I've been there myself, but you can't stay indoors and look at all four walls. You've got to get yeah. a backpack and get yourself out there. It's easy it's to take these tablets. It's easy to take these tablets that the doctor will give you, and then you end mm -hmm. up being down in the gutter. But basically, you've got to fight yourself. You've got to sort it out yourself. If you don't, but you're going to be down there, and then people go on drugs, people go on drinks. And they can never get out the gutter because yeah. they're just the only yeah. way to go. You've See, got some, to sort it out yourself. Some people have, well, obviously, what you've got uh, uh, in spade falls. Um, some people have got that. Some people haven't. And it depends, I guess, how you've been brought up, your chemical makeup, your belief system, 100,000 things. But not everyone can do that. Do you think the government recognises that mental health is an issue for so many people and it needs it sometimes people need to speak to someone or get early help and like you say they don't end up in the gutter but i don't think the authorities do enough uh, okay right okay i mean the thing is every time there's something going on this what pays me off the government the government the government there are only blokes yeah. there are only people up there that don't know which way to turn themselves what are they going to but, but the thing True. is, they're giving money out, yeah? But the yeah. people that they give the money to, how much of it actually goes on to where it's supposed to go to? It's True. like now the NHS. They give money out. Now, rumours is, it's top-heavy. There's too many managers where the money then doesn't get down to the place to actually look after people. Everything yeah, you're right. Like it's it. Often it's the it's the role of a lot of charities who do all of that that hard work. Thank you for calling in. Thank you for that. Um, we're talking about mental health. That was Lorraine in Birmingham. Uh, another message. Afternoon, Trisha. I always I always say we all have mental health, and like you say, at some point in our life we suffer with it, whether through relationships, grief, or cognitive. It does get dismissed quite regularly. We as a society need to be more tolerant, as you never know what's happening in another person's life. True. True. Uh, mine is usually relationship. I tend to be able to cope with other things. I remember breaking down near the pineapples in Tesco many years ago, an awful time. Great discussion as always, Alison. Alison, thank you. Thank you so much for that. that, that, that wise words. Um, James in East Yorkshire is on the line. James, what did you want to say about mental health? Hello, James. <laughs> James not there. Maybe we can. We, we'll come back to James a little bit later. 
let's move on now. I'm going to take more calls on mental health because there's so many of them here. Joseph Cotri Monson. I love talking to Joseph for all things legal. Uh, Joseph, thank you for, for joining me. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, I had a little bit of a rant and rave about mental health not being taken seriously at the beginning of the programme, which actually got people talking. Um, and, uh, you know, when you talk about one in four people will suffer with a mental health issue yep. and people think of down and out but we, it doesn't exclude politicians it doesn't exclude lawyers it doesn't exclude you know pop stars it doesn't exclude garbage collectors yeah um all at some stage uh most of us have some crises right yeah i mean uh we all have ups and downs i think that's the starting point isn't it human beings are fairly fragile and complex creatures we've got yeah. uh this brain which is kind of rapidly developed over a couple of hundred thousand years uh, and all of a sudden we are uh, kind of uh, uh, expected our emotional makeup is expected to have caught up you know and the reality is that it's not always that simple and the uh, modern life is a lot more complex and kind of sometimes uh, sometimes I don't like to use the word depressing but kind of uh, down and humdrum than for example when we were living in a, a kind of hunter-gatherer environment for much of our existence most of our mental evolution you know and like yeah, getting to be out and about getting to forage all of that stuff which sounds tremendously more fun than you know kind of uh, spending nine hours a day in front of a screen which is what a lot of us do. True now let, let's talk about some of the laws that people don't re even realize they could be breaking i yeah. i mean i just had a couple of them like not taking the snow off your windscreen and <laughs> let yes. the cat keep running it's right what sort of laws do people not realize they might be breaking well there's a wonderful article that i think we've both read uh, uh by dean dunham who is the i think the consumer rights uh, editor or contributor for the mail not my favorite paper but an interesting article nonetheless and he's probably the most prominent consumer rights lawyer in the whole of the uk now consumer rights but a few of those uh, crazy laws or kind of obscure laws that he lists uh, in his in his compendium in this article, uh, they're motoring laws and criminal laws. Now, he's not a criminal lawyer. I am. So let's see if a criminal lawyer with, I suppose, probably more than a thousand criminal cases under my belt, blowing my own trumpet. You know, us lawyers, we like to do that. Let's see if we if I agree with our dean. And what I've done, if you'll humor me, Tricia, is I've picked a few uh, from that list of my own. And let's Let's consider whether what the article says is true, whether the claim is true, false, a bit misleading, uh, or kind of maybe true or false, but a bit incomplete. And the first one that really struck me was a really kind of one that I think affects a lot of people and probably people turn a blind eye in their own house to. And aren't we quick to judge others who breaking, break the law? How many people, Tricia, have one of those fire sticks to stream Amazon and Sky Sports without paying? We had the boxing last night, Francis Ngannou losing in the second round to uh, the, the great British hero, uh, Anthony Joshua, in two rounds. You might have felt a little bit shortchanged if you paid for that on pay-per-view. I certainly wouldn't advise you, however, to use one of those fire sticks. Trisha, there's a reason that some people call those fire sticks fraud sticks, and that's because... The statement in that article is true. Uh, Section 11 of the Fraud Act, obtaining services dishon dishonestly. It's actually plain old fraud. And there's a reason they call it that fraud stick. And there are also offences of possession of an article for use in a fraud from the Fraud Act 2006. And that was legislation brought out to combat precisely these type of tech crimes. Fraud Act offence, up to 10 years in prison. Well, I'm not saying that you should panic and put it on the fire quite so quickly with that fire stick just because you're going to get 10 years in prison. But I tell you what, even if it's non-commercial use, a fraud conviction, standard DBS check, up above the right. basic one, criminal record, that can stay on your record for life for certain jobs. You know, talking about recording something, at Steve Denyer, we were talking about all things showbiz, and he was telling me, he was telling us about a bad bunny suing somebody for filming his whole concert on their phone and then putting it on, you know, on social, on YouTube or something. Yeah. So 
is is that the same if you film a, a pop star you go to a concert you film them the whole thing and then you put it on social media are you breaking any laws yeah, or potentially copyright copyright offenses but in reality that is those are intended for people who are doing it for commercial use you know the old style uh bootleg records and uh, bootleg videos and then selling it you know back in the day it'd be vhs's on a sunday market wouldn't it car boot sale uh, but the uh the there is a really important distinction with that type of thing between being sued that's civil that's a, a an action for money uh, uh the, you know what we say when you say i i'll sue you it doesn't mean that you've committed a criminal offense it means you've done something against my rights and yeah, some people can be sued uh, financially if they do things like that. I remember that when people uh, in the early days of broadband, I guess, kind of 10, 15 years ago in this country, people who were downloading a lot of movies got letters saying that they were going to be fined. And these were kind of civil penalties, not criminal. Don't think people are likely to go to criminal courts as a result of that. Right. OK. Uh, and so what other laws has he got there that, that you, what about that one about can you eat and drive or can you get done for eating legally? It's funny. It's you... funny you should raise that one. I remember an episode of Have I Got News For You where the headline was somebody getting done for driving without due care and attention, three to nine points and a fine uh, can be dealt with in the magistrate's court uh, for eating a chick, a Kit Kat chunky. Uh, and the, uh, the the suggestion in the article is yes, uh, it's it's an offence. Ah, they then go on to qualify it and say, well, actually, no, it's not an offence. Okay, so a little bit misleading, but it's all about attention. Okay, uh, if it was an offence, does anybody think that uh, if it was an offence per se, does anybody think really that they would be selling all these snacks and food at petrol stations, knowing that people are going to be eating them straight away? Of course not. It's about what's common sense. If you're if you're not looking at the road because you're looking down at a drink or trying to open some sweets or whatever, uh, yeah, you could be committing an offence because a car is a lethal weapon. This is a huge usually two ton piece of complex metal rattling along at speeds of up to 70 miles an hour, you should be careful. So offenses can take place, but there's a difference between it being an offense to eat something. No, it's not, you know, uh, or on the other, or, or on the other hand, uh, you're eating something, therefore your attention uh, is elsewhere. Well, we've got time for another quick one because I, I tell you why it's a quick one because I want to ask you about your tie. So, <laughs> pick another <laughs> one and then, and then we're going to finish up with your tie. What's another okay. one in that? Well, here's an interesting one. Breaking, and this is probably one that we've all seen every time we see the blues and twos go by, and if it's a police officer uh, on the road or it's an ambulance, and it's breaking another road law to make way for an emergency vehicle. And the article says this, many people believe that if they run a red light or pull in somewhere where ordinarily you shouldn't park in order to make way for an ambulance or police car, it'll be overlooked by the law but that is not the case and you'll still be vulnerable to receiving points on your license. Law says that you've got to do so in a safe manner and not break any laws. I think that's misleading. I'm sorry, Dean Dunham. In fact, in practice, it's just plain wrong. Although you would be technically committing an offence, just think about it. If everybody who committed, who did that was committing an offence, uh, it would discourage drivers from let's say going forward at a junction where there's a red light to let an ambulance through and that was a matter of public policy must be a bad thing the truth is this in most cases driving in such a way to assist police or emergency workers to get by will be overlooked by the law either it's something called a special reason which means the court wouldn't give you the points because even though you'd broken the law there was something special about the circumstances or the prosecution would decide it's not in the public interest to prosecute someone helping the police. So sorry, Dean Dunham, not too impressed with that, but I have to say as a consumer rights champion, very impressed with you. 
<laughs> All right, to finish off your tie, tell us about Oh, your well, tie. I have to say this, and I'm so glad that you've asked me. You notice, you know, of course, and you've often commented, usually I'm, I've, I've got my blazing red tie on. Today, it's the tie of Oxford University Amateur Boxing Club, which I competed for in my uh, days with various levels of success uh, with, as, with my days as a student. Oxford will go to Cambridge today for the varsity match. We lost last year. We have a new coach. I really wish the best of luck to the boys. I hope everybody, primarily, I hope everybody is safe. But I think we also, I think we also want to get that W back, get the trophy back in Oxford. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at the varsity dinner afterwards. Ah, uh, Joseph, you know, I always knew you were a knockout. Same on you, Joseph Cotchy Monson there, all things legal and some of the laws you might not have known about. Um, just just uh, sorting the realities from the, uh, you know, breaking the law to when it's, uh, you're really going to be done to when it's uh, piffle. Can I use that word? Uh, keep your messages coming. Um, lots and lots of messages uh, uh, about mental health. I quite agree with Lorraine. Lorraine called in earlier. Trisha, a good walk out in the fresh air does help with our mental well-being. It's not a cure, but being out in nature is a great help. Susan, Susan, you're bang on. Uh, research has shown that whatever mental health issue you're going through, indeed, being out in nature does help alleviate some of those symptoms. Plus, getting moving does as well. Uh, more of your calls, more of your messages about mental health right after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
thank you for joining me here on Talk TV. My little bit of a rant and rave right at the beginning of the program was about mental health. Um, which should we just keep calm and carry on? Does the government recognise it's an issue? Are people written off or poo-pooed about mental health and mental illness? It's like physical health and physical illness. It's all part of one continuum. Uh, is there stigma around which prevents people talking about mental health and as I said before, let's not forget that I think well, suicide is one of the main killers of young men in the UK um, and men over 50 and 55 represent a large number of people taking their lives. So and a lot of that is down to stigma, not being able to talk about how you feel uh, on the line. We've got Tony in good old Norwich she used to live in Norwich. Hello, Tony. Uh, what did you want to say? Something before about mental health. Yes, uh, hi, Tony. Yeah, I was got to say to you, I worked as a healthcare assistant back in 2004. Do you know St. Right. Do you know St. Like St. Andrew's Hospital in Helston? Yeah, yeah, I know Helston, yeah. Yeah, they were closing walls down then, wherever, and I worked as a healthcare assistant, you know what I mean? Right, right, yeah. And so do, do you think enough um, notice has been given? Do you think there's still a lot of stigma around mental illness? I do. What they do is that what they do is if, if you could, if you what they do is now if you say you've got a mental health problem, all they do is now sign you off on benefits, and that's it. There's no hope no. there at all. Yeah, yeah. There's well, there's apparently a million people, a million people in the UK waiting for mental health, uh, and it can be from talking therapies to uh, seeing a doctor, all those sorts of a million people. Can you believe it? I can believe it. Quite, I can believe it. Yeah. Because I know yeah. somebody, I, I know I know people who want to get back into work, whatever. Now, because there's a stigma behind it, they're having issues with it. You know what I mean? Because I've got mental health issues, people yeah. want to offer my job. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And do you think it's more difficult for men to talk about mental health? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the press, and I suppose women are more likely to talk about it. But men, you've got to appear to be strong all the time. So, do you think it's yeah. tougher for men to to actually? I own up and, and say, you know, I'm struggling? Yeah, but I do, because I'm over 50 myself, and I'm 53, so I find it difficult to talk to my old school. Right, so, yeah. Why? 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 What, what, what stops, do you think, what stops men talking about it? I think that's the embarrassment, because men are meant to be men at there, you know what I mean? There's certain things you don't talk about. Yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. Thank you so much. That's Tony in uh, Norwich. And of course, I was um, uh, a mind uh, patron and ambassador of, of uh, mind uh, in in Norwich actually, for many for 12 years and some, some 12 years. Uh, mental health. We're talking about 03444991000. You can text the word talk to 87222. You can X at talk TV. Now, staying in Norfolk, because uh, there's something about this next story, uh, which is about uh, Norfolk. We're talking about these headlines about police using drones instead of actually going to the site of something that uh, a crime and what have you. And one of the areas it's uh, these drones are going to be trialled is uh, it's called Project Eagle X. It's taking place in Norfolk. Who better to talk about that than uh, the lovely Will Guy? Will, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I. You, you've been so honest as well, talking about mental health as well. So, I mean, I you have a special part. You, you do. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know when you spoke about mental health, it resonated with so many people, especially men, as I said before, who find it difficult to talk about mental health. So that's why I'm doubly appreciative of you. There you are, I've said it. And, and you know what? The best thing is I got a puppy a couple of weeks ago. And that is really helping me with my mental health. Despite the fact I'm getting socks destroyed on a daily basis, the idea of being able to walk a dog in a world where, you know, all I do is talk about technology and everything. There's something really quite special about doing it. And um, one of our stories later on is getting me very excited about the fact that I might be able to talk to my dog soon, which is going to be incredible, if true. I'd love to know what my dog thinks of me. No, maybe you won't. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about these drones. 
because the headlines are about, you know, how many million, uh, 230 million uh, pounds Jeremy Hunt announced to fund this week in, in the budget to help forces pay for modern technology that could save time and money. Uh, the Chancellor said drones would be used for emergencies such as traffic accidents where appropriate. Now, I thought that currently police forces in England and Wales already use drones, except they've got to be they've got to be able to see them. It's got to be in the line of sight. So they're talking about changing that. Tell, talk us through the technology of that. The, the technology is, is quite present and quite sophisticated now because we've been using drones remotely in war scenes and all sorts of places for years. Um, you know, you can fly these things remotely from hundreds, thousands of miles away now. And even the domestic thing that you and I could purchase, I could take my drone up in my back garden now and it would almost reach Swindon, which is about six miles away. So um, you can do that with kind of uh, currently available technology. I think the biggest challenge with what I saw, Tricia, in the um, in the budget was the idea that the government is just throwing money at technology and not trying to solve any of the actual problems any of the problems being far too much administration um not enough coppers on the beat and the idea that you're going to send a drone to do a human's job currently doesn't really work particularly well now um, one of the things they are going to use drones for is if there's a crash and traffic investigation and being able to get some really good angles and views on crashes, etc., will save hours and hours on roads being closed. So you could see that was a really good thing. But um, it, one of the stories I've been most interested in in the last year um, in Oakland, in California, um, the, the local authorities thought it would be a really good idea to take bomb disposal robots and essentially strap shotguns to them and send them down into the streets of Oakland if there was ever any disruption so they didn't have to send human officers. That was roundly met in, in, in California with a derision and that was blocked and they weren't able to do it. But we're getting into a situation where for some forces and for some organisations now, it's easier to send a robot or a lifeless device to do a human's job. And I just don't think it's going to work in many instances of crime. Get more people on the streets. I think it's a bit like you were saying to start off with your puppy. Um, and and the feel and the warmth and feeling something is there for you and listening to you. I think ditto with with police work. Yeah, for, for a real human gives a half a goddamn about you, um, yeah. and is going to do something and might even follow it up. Is going to go a much further than some drone talking to you from from the sky from the scene of your your burglary. And it's going to be trialed in Norfolk because they don't have access to helicopters also because it's really flat so i i'm i'm I, i'm gonna try and get someone from the san diego police force who's trialing it on the on the show to see how it's working out there um but here's something else uh, that i read ai drone has been an an ai drone has been designed to hunt and kill people um it was built by scientists to show just how easy it is yeah but the reality of that is and and um it's one of those stories that's generated some column inches in the last couple of weeks. But we've all been driving lethal weapons since the invention of the car. Um, and I'm not doing, by the way, I'm not doing down what's being said there in that story about a lethal drone. But um, the idea of making a drone a dangerous weapon is, is not as complicated as anybody would think. And um, that, that I think that's more that's more about the technology that's available rather than um the the risk of it happening i mean we are we do we do have this kind of possibility where drones and devices will be used for nefarious purposes you know the very fact like i said the oakland police were looking to just modify their bomb disposal robots by literally sta literally strapping a pump action shotgun onto the front of it as, as protection for for officers so you sort of find yourself in this situation and you're like just because this technology exists, will will it happen? And yes, there is a risk from drones and there is a risk from this technology. And as this technology becomes more widely available to people with nefarious ideas, I'm, I'm sure it will happen. And especially in that story that you've, you've, you've shown there, I think they did it for like $80. They managed to get a cheap drone and they managed to adapt it with a variety of not expensive pieces of consumer electronics. So the danger and the risk is there, but does should that mean that the drone 
suddenly gets blocked from everything else that it it could positively be used for. It hasn't happened with cars and, and other vehicles. So I, I would be it would be a shame if all of a sudden the drone becomes public enemy number one. But here's the thing, with a car, you need a license. Do you need a license for a drone? I mean, how do you know where there's airspace? Uh, you know, what are the laws for that? I mean, are we going to get a situation where uh, we're already talking about companies like Amazon and et cetera, et cetera, and already some car companies have those little robots that deliver things to your door. But are we going to get a, to a situation without regulation where... The sky is full of drones and those little robot things are going there. The, the, are there licenses that you need for a drone? Can you just fly them anywhere? Well, drones above a certain size, you need to have a license in the UK. But the bigger challenge is it's still super easy to go and buy one because your average Chinese um, importer to the UK is certainly not checking that you've got a drone. Drones now below a certain size don't have to qualify for a license because they're not deemed a threat. But right. as could be demonstrated, you could probably do something quite harmful with one of those small devices with, with something attached to it. So you do face a risk there and the regulation um, maybe isn't strong enough. I think that's possibly um, the, the, the sort of the situation that we we find ourselves in. Lots of companies are now using them. Yeah, for example, you said uh, Amazon have been long talking about using them. Now, the reality is Amazon have basically thrown, flown a drone so far at the back of a, a, a warehouse in Cambridgeshire and has landed in the village just out the back of the warehouse. That's the reality of how far it's currently gone. But other organizations are now trying to use drones to speed stuff up. For example, uh, blood transplant, blood or uh, organ, organ donations across large hospital campuses and those kind of things, rather than having to drive it around a hospital network, literally flying it straight there, line of sight with a couple of minutes, you can get the, the organ there much quicker and much, much fresher. So um, there's all sorts of uh, ways that drones and technology will be used. And I hope it doesn't just become something that gets outlawed because we're worried somebody's going to do something bad with it. People have been doing bad things with all manner of machinery since since things were created, sadly. Absolutely. And this one, you're with your little puppy. Uh, talk to the animals. Dr. Lou Doolittle did it, but this is how AI, uh, uh, could, it's on the cusp of a breakthrough that would allow people and animals and even wild animals, to chat, to, to talk. Really? Well, it's one of these great stories where the Daily Mail, a reporter in the Daily Mail suggests that possibly between 12 and 36 months, we're going to be having conversations with our animals. And they reckon it's because now the technology is getting so good, they can pick up like micro signals from animals, which mean certain things. So it's almost like analyzing your pet with artificial intelligence to, to, to kind of translate what it's saying. And um, part of me, even though I did, I, I, it does worry me when people talk to a dog like it's a human being or whatever, because there's clearly a, a, a bit of a different guy. <laughs> well, I do it as well, but I, I find myself uh, criticizing myself for doing it. But um, just imagine the idea that if you you basically your, your, your dog, your dog is saying to you, yeah, can I go out for a, a wee before Trish is on talk TV or, uh, you know, is asking for asking for some more, more, uh, more meat or whatever. Um, I don't know if it would be a good thing or a bad thing. But but we've gone on about talking to the animals, as I said before, from Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> um, we're not meant to talk to animals. I mean, why do we need to know everything that everybody? I mean, well, this, could, why this could be a huge this could be a huge leap. This could be you're you're discounting what could be, uh, you know, that could be there could be peace in the world between animals and. And, and humans, you know, fox hunting might suddenly end because the fox tells the hunter that they know where they live or something. Um, and uh, you, you could be in a you could be in a situation here where the where the animals where the animals scare the uh, scare the hunters. Um, but I don't I don't know I I kind of I quite like the idea that technology is going to enable us to do this. But I, I, I'm beginning to wonder what else we'll be communicating with human beings. Like, is somebody going to suggest that my lawn is going to tell me when it wants cutting it, not just that, because it's too high, but like the grass on a molecular level is actually communicating for that to happen. And I think there'll be an awful lot of this over the next 
five to ten years and as you and I often say just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it and there'll be an awful lot of that in the world of artificial intelligence well King Charles talks to plants and apparently they talk back. <laughs> I just love the idea of a fox saying you know hey you I know where you live I know I mean, where you live <laughs> I know where you live. Very <laughs> sly. Thank you, Will Guyatt. Uh, brilliant as ever with our technical roundup for the week. I, I, I'll never get that image out of my, my brain, the fox uh, taking on the uh, hunter. Maybe it's time. Um, wedding photographers versus the clergy. That's coming up next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Just uh, reading some of your messages about mental health. Uh, great show, Tricia. You said you were in your 60s. <laughs> I am 66. Uh, you look great. Oh, thank you. Huge respect to you. Thank you. Uh, mental health. Tricia, though totally, absolutely sympathetic to anyone who's experiencing mental health problems, I wonder how many individuals are using, quote unquote, this uh, condition fraudulently in order to claim benefits. I'm, I'm sure there are some people out there, but I'm just saying it's a minority. You could say that about disabilities in general, but do we punish the vast majority for what a few people, um, you know, naughty people are doing? Um, mental health, if we were all swinging the lead, i.e. pretending to be ill, would I take an injection every month that knocks me out for three days and take tablets that make me virtually impotent? 
There you go. Mental health, Anne. Uh, the greatest therapy, in my view, for mental health is by going out of my local area because there are a lot of people that live near me and they only ever reopen emotional wounds and it keeps me entrenched in a vicious cycle. I feel that I'm able to forget about any emotional pain when I go out of my local area. Thank you, Anne. Um, and I guess it's often we need to have help in order not to be in a situation that further triggers us. Um, my mum always used to say, and both my parents were psychiatric nurses, by the way, but my mum always used to say, when I used to say, oh, I can't deal with that, I'm avoiding that. And she used to say, excuse my West Indian accent here, dots. She used to say, you, you know, you'll end up hiding from the whole world. Your world shrinks. Can't go there. <gasps> Can't do that. Can't go there. Your world shrinks, 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 and then you're imprisoned. So helping people to get help, to be able to talk about it without being poo-pooed about it right at the early stage stops people's world shrinking, stops them not being able to work. And again, as somebody else said, uh, lots of people who have mental ill health still want to work. You might have to adapt the workplace just why you would if somebody is in a wheelchair. Three double four four nine nine one thousand. You can text the word talk to eight seven triple two. You can X at talk TV. You can also WhatsApp oh three double four four nine nine one thousand as well. Um, and and I will be coming back to more of your calls in just a sec. But I want to talk about this headline. I kind of, when I first saw it, I was like, what? Um, Vickers versus photographers, say the headlines. Uh, now, bear in mind, there's some 275,000 weddings in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a big business. The average UK couple spent £20,700 on their wedding last year. And when it comes to the money for photographers, uh, one thousand thousand three hundred pounds they spend that's an average some people are going to go you what i spent a lot more but a couple of weeks ago more than 900 wedding photographers signed a change.org petition complaining that some clergymen and women are making it impossible for them to take pictures inside churches because of their and i quote rude humiliating aggressive and abusive behavior. Some vicars apparently can be a complete pain when it comes to wedding photographers in churches. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury has said that. Uh, photographers have complained of being exiled from the ceremony uh, on, one, on one TikTok. One officiant halts the proceedings, refuses to continue unless the photographer stops taking photographs. And of course, now there are videos. Um, at our faith panel last week, we actually asked what's what's more important, capturing the moment or the spirituality of the moment. Uh, joining me now is, um, I thought we'd come to a wedding photographer, um, is Rashan Jass, who is a wedding photographer. He joins me uh, now. Rashan, is it difficult to, I mean, do you take photos inside a church? Um, have you ever encountered an officiant or a, a vicar or what have you who's kind of taken issue with you doing that? Trisha, nice to see you again. I hope you're well. Um, and to answer your question, yes, I have. I've I've had, you know, vicars say to me, you know, you can't go here, you can't go over here, uh, you can't do this and you can't do that. And I'm just like, well, unless you give me a specific reason as to why I cannot do that. And then hopefully we can engage in a positive conversation about what I can do and what I can't do to, uh, to, to serve our couple that's being married, because let's be, let's be real honest here. We're only here to serve the couple that's being married. And that includes you who are, you, you know, who's leading the service as well. So, uh, you know, I want to engage in a positive conversation about what we can do so that we can actually produce the goods for the happy couple on that day. So do you have a conversation with the clergyman before the whole wedding? Or have you been in a situation where you're actually taking photographs and no one's really said anything about the do's and don'ts to you, but you can see by the clergy person or the officiant behaviour that they're like really in a bit of a strop with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I haven't been in that position, thankfully. And that's primarily because 
I, you know, I work tireless, tirelessly to make sure that my my day is mapped out in terms of if I'm working in the morning and I'm doing the pre-wedding shoot, uh, you know, the, the pre-wedding -wedding prep, uh, then I do that and I make sure that I get all of the images that I need for that. And then I go to the church early before the couple gets there. And then I speak to the clergyman, the vicar, the ministers, whoever it may be who's leading that service. I speak to them prior to the, the, the couple getting there or anybody walking down the aisle. And we have a conversation. Now, as I said, I've had, you know, I've had vicars, ministers say to me, you know, and, and kind of give me the cold shoulder and, and be like, oh, here comes another photographer and blah, blah, blah. But it's the way that you approach them and let them know that, you know, you're not here to take over their service or ruin their service or or anything like that. You're here to actually help and, and aid what they're doing. And also primarily, and this is really important, we're here to freeze this fantastic moment in time of of the joining of you know a happy couple together and freezing these this moment in time so that they can cherish cherish this for forever you know so we got to work together on this i think this is ridiculous well now more and more people want videos don't they and i know yeah. a friend of mine when her um daughter got married it wasn't even one videographer there's lots of them all over the place it doesn't is there a point where it becomes quite intrusive and it's more about the capturing the moment than the actual spirituality of the moment yes and and no um i think the the newer photographers that come in or the photographers that have a style of being up close and personal uh that that's when it can cause a problem or the photographers that choose not to spend money on lenses that allow them to be away from the action but able them to, to zoom in on the action from a, from a distance. Same with videographers. Videographers do not need to be a, a, a part of the service, if you like. They don't need to be the best man in, in the lineup or anything like that. They can be away on the sidelines, but have sufficient um, equipment that allow them to get the, the shots that they need. And that's how I work. So, you know, I understand both sides of it, but we have to, we have to realize that we're only here for the couple. And that's it. Yeah. We're here for the couple, you know. So what we need to do is make sure that we 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 can talk, we converse, and we do what we can do to make sure that the, the couple are happy at the end of the day when the shoot's done, when they've gone and they've you know they've gone on their honeymoon and we're working, you know, doing the edits and stuff like that. We got to make sure that we're giving them the best that we can give them, and and also with the the, the happy couple, they have to also let the uh, the the you know the vicars and the ministers know that they've got a photographer that's coming in and these are the kind of shots that they want so that the ministers are also aware that when the photographer comes in that they are going to have to stand behind them at some point because these are the shots that the couple have asked for yeah because i i'm guessing these 900 photographers uh, i i guess that when that process doesn't happen then feathers are ruffled um now last week on our faith panel we had someone uh from the quakers and they said it never happens because they don't have photographers during the ceremony before and after but not during the ceremony so i mean that i guess that's another they, they set might set things up but they keep it really spiritual so do you i mean do you think we've gone too far do you you know why do you need the actual moment of that happening why can't you take pictures afterwards why do you need it done live why can't you go back and pose the photos 100 percent, you can and i think this is ah. where photographers yeah, photographers need to be, you know, having those kind of conversations with the couple beforehand in terms of this is what the minister wants because, the, you know, there's there's numerous conversations that happen. It happens yeah. firstly with the, the the ministers, the vicars, and stuff like that, and making sure that the date is set and and all of those kind of things. And then the particulars happen within that conversation, and then they come to the photographers. And at that point, they need to be letting the photographers know what they can do and what they can't do. And if it's a case of Right, we can't take pictures. We can't set up um, because there are certain parts in the ceremony that the the um, the ministers don't want me to photograph. I mean, that's particularly when they're signing their documents, and I get that. I understand. I let them do their thing, and then it and then we get into the posed photographs in the actual church. So it's about having a conversation and about and about being honest beforehand, as opposed to allowing people to come in fairly not clued up, not understanding yeah. what's going on. And, and and being told on the day that they can't do X, Y, and Z. People have to understand that 
it's a pressurized job, right? Being a photographer at a wedding, it's a pressurized job because you only really have one shot, one chance to capture the moment. Yeah. Because when they, when they say I do, and, and the minister says, okay, you can now kiss the bride and you know, you've got one chance. You can't just be like, uh, uh, hold on one second, please. No, no, no. M my lighting was all wrong or the composition. We can't do that. We, no, but some uh, some have done that. That's why they're complaining. Some photographers are just saying, hello, hang on just a minute. Can you do that again? You know? So I guess if they didn't have the conversation beforehand, you're going to get those ridiculous situations. But I'm glad you've said that. I'm glad you have focused on the fact that I'm always saying it. Communication is the key. And Rajan, you sound like the perfect for dog wedding photographer because you have those conversations. So you wouldn't have signed that that petition because you know how to do it better. You need to get out there and teach other photographers how to do it. <laughs> I appreciate Rashad, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Rashad Jasso, who's a, a wedding photographer, talking about the fact that, yeah, he's got a good point. These 900 wedding photographers signing a petition complaining about clergymen and women maybe you know conversation about the do's and don'ts all that's got to happen way before and then maybe you won't get in that situation where vicar says no pop it interesting one i'm being interested in your thoughts uh quick uh oh weddings i quite agree with the fact that some vicars can be a pain re-wedding ceremonies a friend of mine said his vicar was constantly moaning about the mess that confetti created within the grounds of the church this attitude really does spoil a very special day. You can always use that confetti that melts when you hose it down. Uh, dogs, we were talking um, to Will Guyatt about AI. Uh, greetings, Trisha, re-talking to the animals. I myself do it all the time to my little dog. I know he understands. For instance, I will say to him, Mummy's going to bed now. Mummy's tired. He follows me and he jumps on the bed. See, you don't need AI to, for, for that. Um Oh, Tom's a wedding photographer. I'm going to talk to him after the break. We'll also be talking about more of things about mental health after the break. Uh, plus a lot, lot more. Is London really a no-go area for Jewish people? Uh, that's what the headline says. But I always like to dig beneath those and hear the real stories. All that, plus your calls and uh, your messages uh, right after the break. Uh, stay with us here on Talk TV. More to come in just a moment. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're we're supposed to, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. It's the ghost of Benjamin Disraeli. He says that this week on That Was The Woke That Was, Pete Barnes is going to be very rude to Ben <laughs> Habib because he's a communist. And Stephen Barrett and Lizzie Cundy are going to witness as well. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs>
um, those shots if, you know, they, they know that it's house rules, really, whatever the vicar wants. Um, yeah. I did I did narrow yeah, down on. with one vicar. I did narrow down with one vicar why he didn't want me any... My, my preferred is at the front so I can get the, the guests' yeah. faces, yeah. Um, but off to the side so they can't see me. But the reason yeah. he told me why, why he didn't want me there was because he gets distracted. And I think that's genuinely the, the reason, really, is, is most people get distracted, they're public speaking, and they don't want somebody moving around. And yeah. totally understandable. Absolutely. Tom, thank you so much for calling in. Um, just fleshing out that why Vickers might be a little bit wary of photographers, um, you know, so uh, thanks, Tom, for that. I, I, any other photographers that uh, do call in um, that, as I said before, uh, plus mental health. I want to come to and, you know, you know, if you watch this, this show by now, um, you know, when I hear uh, somebody say something or a headline. <laughs> clickbait. I want to get beneath the surface and hear the real story. Well, the headline said, Advisor warns London a no-go zone for Jews every weekend. Um, if, if you're interested, there's actually a fascinating history on how politicians have used that phrase, no-go zone, to frighten um, for all sorts of reasons. But anyway, th what this came from Robin Sim Simcox, who is the government's counter-terrorism counter extremism commissioner. Uh, he said London has become a no go zone for Jews during weekend pro Palestinian marches. Uh, and he also urged ministers to be willing to accept higher legal risks when tackling uh, extremism. Now, in answer to that, a spokesman for Mr. Sunak said that Mr. Simcox was referring, quote unquote, and I'm, I'm quoting here, referring to intimidation by a minority at protests in London at weekends. We have sadly seen an increase in anti-Muslim hatred as well as anti-Semitism, she said. The PM would like would continue to urge those taking part to be mindful of the upset and distress it can cause. Peaceful protest is a fundamental, a fundamental to our democracy. But let's talk about that no zone, because that is what makes people feel unsafe. Um, in response to Simcox's uh, comments, we've got uh, Daniel Sugarman, Director of Public Affairs at the Board of Deputies of British Jews, said, and I'm quoting here, I don't feel particularly comfortable with the language of no-go zones. Uh, but, but he added, many British Jews feel extremely disturbed by the weekly m marches through the centre of London. Um, Rabbi Herschel Gluck, uh, he's a rabbi who is president of the Shomrim Neighbourhood Watch Group in London, said he was very disturbed by Simcox's suggestion, adding, it's like saying the earth is flat. It's got nothing to do with reality. To say there are no-go zones in London for Jews is a total and utter fiction. Um, some people agree, some people disagree. This is somebody I've spoken to before, and as he, I, I love... I, I'd love to add different layers because politicians need to pit one person. Well, most politicians need to pit us against each other. Otherwise, they've basically got nothing to talk about. Joining me now is Hannah Wiesfeld. If you watch this programme, we've had her on before. Uh, very positive uh, reaction to her because she is indeed brilliant, if I say so myself. Executive director and founder of Yeshaj, and she joins me now. That let me ask you, London, a no-go zone for Jews. I mean, that's what all the headlines say. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's interesting kind of way you, what you just said, which is that, you know, politicians need to pit us against each other. And I think what's happened and is happening kind of in the last 48 hours with, with the Israel-Palestine conflict is that we've seen this kind of explosion of how, how much can we export this conflict well import it onto the streets of london and actually pit communities against each other in the, in a way which is really problematic and is making what is a very tense atmosphere here even worse so look it's absolutely the case that there has been a significant and very sharp increase in anti-semitism and islamophobia since october the 7th but we're now in a space where we're basically saying anybody who comes out on the streets to protest for a ceasefire 
is an extremist who is saying, you know, that Jews are not welcome in Britain and anybody who's Jewish needs to stay at home because there are these people on the streets that are making sure that it's not safe for you to walk around. It's obviously much more complex than that. And there are pockets of those demonstrations where people hold placards and say things which are problematic that I find problematic. And there are hundreds of thousands of people on the streets calling for a ceasefire, which you can agree or disagree with that call, but that's an absolutely legitimate democratic right that people have to protest. What I think is the responsibility of politicians is to actually dial down the rhetoric and say, how do we protect Jews in an environment which is quite tense and fraught and protect the rights of people to democratically protest and not suggest that those two things are a zero sum game, which is basically where we are today. One of the things as well that disturbs me is this need to paint things in black and white. For instance, um, you know, you, uh, I keep saying you can be, for instance, anti-Hamas, but pro, uh, pro-Palestinian people. You can be anti-Netanyahu, um, but be pro-Jewish. People seem to think that a, a block of people only think this or only think that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And and actually, this conflict has almost become this kind of very simplistic, you know, I think social media has a lot to answer for in that regard. But this very simplistic thing, which says, you decide which side you are on. And once you have picked that side, you are basically against the other side, which sounds kind of a, almost childish. But I think that is really what is happening. So that there is this sense that if you go out and you protest for a ceasefire, you, you support Hamas, repeating the actions of October the 7th. And if you think that Israel has a right to defend itself, you support the killing of tens of thousands of Israel or of Palestinian children. Both of those things are false equations. You know, at, you know, and there are people that think both those things, you know, at extreme ends. But but actually there are large numbers of people in the middle and polling of the UK public shows that the overwhelming majority of people actually just Oh, I think she's just frozen the most Sorry, so we just missed what you said oh, there. Lovely. Oh, I just was saying that, that, that the polling of the British public shows that the overwhelming majority of the British public believe that this conflict is very bad for all the people involved and would like to see an end to it. You know, and actually they don't take hardline positions in either direction. But the way in which it's portrayed in the media, the mainstream media and, the, and within social media is that there is extremists at either end of this and that they control the discourse and the narrative. And actually, it's incumbent on, I think, upon everyone to elevate the voices of moderates who are, who are looking for a way out of the conflict. Uh, and one um, rabbi pointed out that there are many Israelis, there are many Jewish people in this march uh, as well. So, I mean, I, I wish the nuances, as you were saying, the nuances aren't being brought into the discourse. Yeah, look, there is there is a Jewish block at those demonstrations, and there are Jews that protest. I would say that it, it, it's it's not an it's not a huge number of people. It's not an no. insignificant number of people, you know. And there and there are people, and I don't want to diminish the fact that there are people that feel quite threatened by them. But actually, fundamentally, the call for a ceasefire is not an anti-Jewish call. I think it plays out as a you know, and 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 we have seen pockets of protests where people are supporting the actions of Hamas as legitimate yeah. resistance you know uh, you know and that is very offensive oh she's frozen again but uh, a terrorist attack. yeah sorry hannah we, we we just lost the end of that you were saying yeah people uh supporting hamas or the, that minority uh of yes, people but it's, supporting it's a minority it's a minority yeah. and but and i think it's really important to hold on to that that it is not the majority of people saying that what are the dangers of painting, uh, you know, uh, you know, London as a no-go area for Jewish people? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm, I equated it. I was discussing this with someone, and I equated it with during uh, Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, you know, that the, there was that fringe of people who joined in uh, that, that sort of painted everybody going uh, marching in Black Lives Matter as uh, being a looter or being dangerous or what have you. There is always that conflation. But what is, uh, and that, that it wasn't safe for white people to be around in Black Lives Matter marches, which, you know, there were lots of white people in the Black Lives Matter marches. But I'm interested in when you call some area a no-go zone, a no uh, go area or zone 
what does that do to people what how does it make them feel how does it exacerbate issues well, it's an, I think it's a really important point, which is that there is also a psychological element of this, which is that the more you make the point that something is not safe, the less safe that people feel, and, and it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you say that London is a no-go zone, and people say, well, I'm not sure I should go into central London because I'm not sure it's safe for me. They don't go, and then after a few weeks of not going, they feel that they can't go anymore, and it almost, it almost is a gift to that minority of people who are trying to achieve that aim, which is that that suddenly it becomes a no-go zone just by virtue of the discussion around it. And I think that this is the thing that we really need to push back on, which is that there has got to be a way, even for, for us as, as, as British citizens, you know, and people that live in this country, which is by and large a very peaceful and democratic and tolerant country, to be able to sit down and, and have the muscle for difficult conversations. People have extremely different opinions and they are vehemently different. But we have to be able to sit down and find a way to coexist and allow very different opinions to, to sit side by side and find a way for people to do that in a non-threatening way. There will be fringes where, you know, where, where there is unacceptable discourse. But beyond those fringes, we've got to be able to tolerate difficult conversation. And, and I think what's happening today is, is that we're almost kind of destroying the muscle that exists for communities to, 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 to engage in difficult dialogue with each other. And once that doesn't exist, you create massive polariz pol polarization in society where people are kind of almost siloed in, in Muslim communities and Jewish communities and Palestinian communities unable to interact with each other. And that's incredibly dangerous. You know, for, it's incredibly dangerous for life in the UK, but it's also profoundly unhelpful in terms of helping to think how, you know, the international community and the UK as an international player can, can get around the table and be part of the solution. Because actually what happens is the government then just responds to the extremes on the streets. Yeah, absolutely. And, and takes that as a vote. Uh, as norm let's talk about the rise of you know um anti-semitism is it a rise or is it fanning flames which were simmering there anyway has it given license to a lot of people who maybe kept their anti-semitism um subtle <laughs> or under wraps has it given them license to be more overt about it or do you think there's genuinely more anti-semitism people who are new to the party so to speak well, I, I, look, I, I am not an expert on kind of anti-Semitism tracking the trends, but I think it's a mixture of both. So you have people for whom this is the perfect excuse, right? Which is that they don't particularly like Jews or they, you know, they don't really understand the community, you know, for whatever reason, they have a, a prejudice. And suddenly there's a what they perceive to be a legitimate reason to air that in public. And actually it gets normalized and it's not such a fringe thing to do anymore to make an anti-Semitic comment in public. So I think there's that. I think there is a real issue with conflation of religious communities, diaspora communities, with the actions of governments overseas. So this sense of, well, Jews are somehow responsible for what the Israeli government is doing. And I think it's the same with Muslims, but people look at Muslims and say, well, somehow you are responsible for Hamas, even though, you know, that Muslims live all over the world and Hamas is a tiny minority of people in a country that most Muslims in this country actually, you know, are not from that part of the region either. Um, and so there is this real conflation of religious minorities with what's happening on the ground over there. And people, you know, are fundamentally, I think, unable to distinguish and, and, and look at things in a complex way. So you kind of say, well, Israel's a Jewish country, the Jewish country, this Jewish country is doing things that I don't like, and therefore they are a legitimate target of my grievance. And so you end up with a massive conflation. And I think it's really hard for people sometimes to just understand where the line is, you know, and, and what's legitimate criticism, what is anti-Semitic, where should I direct my rage when people feel rage by what they see on the news? Yeah. Who, who is the correct recipient of my rage? And some of it, I think, and, and, and I don't say this to diminish the, 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 the reality of, of, of the fact that there is a spike in anti-Semitism. Some of it, I think, is just sometimes badly understood and misunderstood kind of um, politics, which is that I know that many Jews in the UK, you know, travel to Israel, have friends and family in Israel, and therefore I, I, they are a legitimate um, recipient of my grievances. Um, you know, and, yeah. and it's people's unnuanced understanding or misunderstanding of what is going on. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, it's the nuances. And so when people talk about no go zones and what have you, uh, it plays to all of the worst parts of, uh, you know, our worst fears, doesn't it? Yeah. And to be honest with you, there are bad faith actors that also are using this conflict to sow division. And, and, and they're always are, but, I, but, but I, I haven't witnessed it to the extent that we're seeing it in this conflict. And, you know, this is the worst, and I've been working on Israel-Palestine issues for over a decade. This is obviously the worst outbreak of violence in that period of time. So it's extreme. But, but the bad faith actors who look at this as an opportunity to sow division amongst different communities and pit them against each other, this is like a gift to them, which is that people are, people are fearful for legitimate reasons and you stoke fear and, and you turn it and you create a reality in which people then feel that they, that they are not welcome or that they don't have a future here. And, and people look for sensation, you know, as you said at the beginning of this clickbait, which is that it's a really good headline that there's no go zone for Jews that there's no future for Jews in Britain. I mean, I can tell you as someone who leads a very Jewish life in quite a non-Jewish neighbourhood of London, that that my experience, and I'm, this is very anecdotal, is that, you know, I mix in pretty non-Jewish circles day to day in my neighbourhood, and I'm very publicly Jewish, and people are nothing other than interested, open, sympathetic, they know what I do for my job, and they ask really legitimate questions in a very thoughtful way. And that's not everybody's experience, but I think it is really important to push back against this idea that there is no space for kind of reasonable discussion about this stuff, because that because that's not true. It's not true. And the more we say it, the more true it becomes. Yeah, and absolutely. And uh, that's why I love uh, speaking to you on this show, because I hope we open people's eyes to the nuances and uh, give them the license to uh, talk about these things in, a, in a, a respectful way. Hannah, love having you on the show. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's Hannah Weisfeld, uh, Weisfeld, who's executive director and founder of Yashad uh, there. Um, like I said, I like to dig beneath the clickbait. And I love that my Saturday and Sunday audiences, uh, I always say it's mind, body and soul. You actually think things through rather than da, 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 da. You know what I'm talking about. Back with more after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Let me just throw a few figures at you. 1.86 million people were in contact with mental health services in the UK. Uh, that's by the end of uh, 2023. Um, 444,904 people were in contact with children and young people's mental health services at the end of November 2023. 266,575 people uh, with learning disabilities and autism services um, and 450,355 new referrals were received. 2.17 uh, million care contacts were attended during November. 21,737 people were subject to the Mental Health Act, including 16,340 people detained in hospital at the end of November. Now, those are all of the people who showed up for services. There's another million people on the waiting list. And yet, and yet, to quote uh, the Centre for Mental Health Chief Executive Andy Bell, uh, there's a virtual absence of support for mental health in the budget. Uh, he said, uh, we're disappointed to see no additional services, support for services such as social care, suicide prevention and public health. Local government, which provides these services, is facing real-term cuts even after a decade of austerity. Um, the most recent public health settlement saw a 2% cut after inflation following a 26% reduction since 2016. Now, this means that councils will have less capacity to protect the public's mental health, prevent suicide deaths, or support people with mental health needs. He said, this is a deeply disappointing budget for the nation's mental health services remain underfunded, while measures to improve mental health by addressing factors that worsen it, such as poverty, pollution and poor housing, are still not being taken. Joining me now is uh, Mark uh, Varmeyer, who is a psychotherapist. Um, he's a, an integrative uh, psychotherapist. He's currently running his own practice in Brighton and Lewis in East Sussex, has, having worked for the NHS, Relationships Australia, and spent four years as a psychotherapist in palliative care, working for a hospice. Uh, Mark joins me now. Mark, missed opportunity. Uh, when I read out those numbers, people just think, ugh, numbers. We know that a very conservative estimate is one in four people at some stage during their lives will have mental health needs or an issue that needs addressing. And so that means, you know, everybody knows somebody who's had some mental health issue. I think you're exactly right. I mean, those numbers, when we really stop to think about them, that they represent individuals, it's terribly worrying. And when the budget was released and I heard it and realised that there once again was going to be no additional funding whatsoever for mental health. Mental health has, um, for a significant period of time now, it been in the shadows of physical health. We're in the midst of a mental health crisis, driven firstly by the pandemic and secondly by the cost of living crisis. And it seems like there is very little in place there that's going to alleviate the problems that we've seen mounting over quite some years now. Now, Mark, whenever I, you know, do this subject, you're going to get, me I'm going to get messages and calls saying, ah, oh, I know somebody who's just faking it to get off work. Everybody knows of somebody who they think they know. They, as I said, I asked one caller, do you know about their lives? Do you know about this? They're, oh, but I heard from so-and-so who's quite high up in so-and-so. What does that do that 
that image or that um, stereotype of somebody slacking off because of mental health, not pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, not just overcoming it, all of those, all of those things. What does that do to someone who really, who, who might be struggling? It's it's very sad that we still have those sorts of messages out there. And I think part of the problem, Tricia, is that unlike physical health and physical problems and physical disabilities, mental health is often hidden. It's behind closed doors. Most of us manage to put on some degree of a brave face. And so it's not written on our forehead. It's not there, if you like, in our bodies necessarily. So people don't really know how much we're suffering. And I think what's really damaging about these sorts of messages is that it perpetuates the stigma of mental health and people find it more difficult to come forward and access services, what services are available, but even private services like my own, people find it more difficult to come forward and say, look, actually, I'm having a crisis or I'm having a problem or I don't really know how to deal with this and it would really help me to talk to someone. So it's an ongoing issue, this, this uh, stigma. Uh, the other thing that I pointed to was when, um, sadly, when it comes to suicide, uh, men, uh, young men, I, I know for many years it's been the number one killer of younger men. It's also an issue in, in men over 55. It's, it's part of that reason, a very large chunk of that reason is men, uh, for many different reasons, not being able to talk about or access help right at the early stages, right? That's exactly right. And I think, you know, we've we've briefly talked about the stigma around mental health and the stigma around mental health for men is, I would argue, even stronger than it is for women. So men continue to be brought up with this message that you need to just get on with it. You need to provide um, stiff up a lip, you know, don't show your feelings. And of course, there are times where we do need to get on with it. But when we're in a mental health crisis, frankly, we cannot get on with it. And it is far better for us to seek help at an earlier stage than to wait until we either figurative or literally hit the wall. And as a man working you know, on the front line of mental health services, as a psychotherapist, um, when men do access our clinic and when men do come and see me, it's really telling that they've usually got to a much greater degree of crisis, and this is a generalization, but a much greater degree of crisis, arguably, than women have. Because because they've not felt able to actually, it's it's seen as a weakness in men, right? It, it's, it's seen as a weakness. They've tried to cope. They've used perhaps maladaptive coping strategies, like, well, I'll just have a drink every evening to sort of get through it or they've got prescription drugs or illicit drugs or whatever it might be. But eventually, of course, if we are in a real mental health crisis and there's something that needs to be worked through, that's not something we can do on our own. So, yeah, when men do come and um, approach our service, it's quite often with a sense of shame that they do that. And it's not until they're in the room and they understand really what it's about that things start to change. And here's another one. I'm throwing every every stereotype at you so we can sort of <laughs> get rid of them one by one. The other one is that you hear is like, oh, young people are less resilient, you know, because of COVID. There's a, that continue. I hate that dumping on young people. But one of the things that's dumped on them is that they're quote unquote, they're less resilient. They wimp out earlier. I'd suggest it's because they talk. They some of the messages getting through and they're more likely to seek help at an earlier stage um, rather than just battle through and present, you know, when things are really, really bad. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, I think there's a lot of criticism of younger people, and yet I've had the privilege and continue to have the privilege of working with young people, people in their 20s. Um, it's really interesting how they're much more open to talking about mental health. They're much faster to access services when they need it. But with that, they take a lot, they seem to take a lot of responsibility for their mental health, but perhaps in ways that my generation, particularly men of my generation, didn't. And there's one other aspect that I'd like to address with this with young people, because it makes me feel rather angry. Young people, let's, where we're referring to young people, let's say 18, 19 year olds, 
they've spent a good two to three years of their lives living in a mix of lockdown conditions, restrictions, the uncertainties of COVID. Is it any wonder that they're now at times struggling to adapt to, right, suddenly I've got to be out there in the world, I've got to be social, I've got to know what I'm going to do with my life, I've got to adapt to a working environment or an apprenticeship or to university. I think that's really, really hard. And the, the statistics show that it is significant there are significantly more young people proportionately suffering with mental health problems at the moment in our society and i think the pandemic the pandemic is a significant reason for that and we need to be looking at that and thinking about it yeah and uh, uh, the pandemic for when you talk about 18 year olds so you know teenagers it's at mm. that stage of life when you have all of those doubts anyway when you're trying to work out who you are when you're starting to socialize when you're starting to gain some sort of independence so for many of them and i know because i work with uh, homestart i'm a very proud patient of homestart mm -hmm. in in norfolk um the other area is toddlers and youngsters when they too are working out who they are and we don't yet know well we're starting to see some of the effects on them of lockdown but we don't yet know how that's going to play out when they're older no, that's exactly right. I mean, the idea that the pandemic is over, and of course, we'd like it to be over, and we'd like to be able to go back to normal and forget all about it. But the reality is we've all been through a collective trauma, and some of us have obviously been significantly more impacted by COVID than others, whether that's through losing loved ones or having long COVID ourselves, whatever it might be. And as you say, you know, that, that early period for children is extremely important around socialisation. And where they've been stuck at home with parents who are perhaps very anxious as well and wondering how they're going to make ends meet and trying to juggle working from home with being a parent. These children aren't socialized and suddenly they're expected to just get on with it. So I think it's going to be you know, scientifically interesting, but I would also say really important to watch how this unfolds for children over the coming years and, and, and decade. Absolutely. And and finally, you know, the government's banging on about getting people back to work. But if you don't fund mental health services and people always connect mental illness and mental health, I keep trying to remind them there's a continuum, you know, it's just like physical health. You can have people with mental illness who actually have pretty good mental health because they're on top of their medication, they adapted their lifestyle. You can have people uh, with just rotten mental health creating all sorts of havoc. So uh, without funding all of the things that we're talking about and people, it's not just mental health services, is it? It's, it's uh, suicide prevention, it's early intervention, it's parenting, it's all of those things. Without those being addressed am i right in saying that the, the government's got diddly squat hope of getting people uh who are signed off work back to work yeah i i i wish it was different but unfortunately that's my fear too that this is um a very short-sighted approach to an endemic problem where the key from my perspective is prevention and early intervention now i'm not here as an economist but i'm pretty sure that the figures would stack up on that but what i can tell you as a clinician is that the earlier we can intervene both particularly with young people but actually with anybody the earlier we can intervene and either put preventative measures in place so that people don't find themselves in a mental health crisis um, and early intervention system so that people aren't ending up in a psychiatric system, for example, so where we're tipping over into mental illness, it's not only economically beneficial, but people, the, the statistics show that people are far more likely to get better more quickly. So it makes sense to do that. And if people are feeling better, if people are feeling more functional again, then they're able to go back to work. It's a complete fallacy that people who have mental health issues, cannot work and that cannot be highly productive. Of course they can. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, as I always say, it's cheaper, it's kinder, it's emotionally better to build a fence at the top of a cliff than to uh, end up funding ambulances at the bottom, if I can put it that way. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. I, it's a, a, an issue I'm very passionate about, as you might have guessed. Mark Barmeyer, who is a psychotherapist in the Brighton and Lewis areas. Uh, what are your feelings on that? Or do you still believe 
that old Furby. The people are just making it up because you can't see. It's not like a broken leg. It's not like a broken arm. Um, and I'd say to you, if you think somebody is, is, is quote unquote faking it, ask yourself this. How much do you know about their childhood? I mean, really know from them. How do you, much do you know about their private life that you really know that they and here's another thing if you are that judgmental if you have a view on mental illness and pull yourself up by the bootstraps and people are faking it how likely is someone with a mental health problem how likely are they to go to you to talk about their issues hmm? think about that one back with more in a minute Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Was supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Well, my final story for the day sort of brings together a lot of things we've been talking about. International Women's Day yesterday, we've been talking about mental health issues. Uh, those things all come together. Let me throw a few figures at you so you can grasp. Um, the Ministry of Defence recently published its UK Armed Forces biannually, uh, biannual uh, uh, diversity statistics. Now, the report states that female representation in the UK regular forces, um, 2023, 11.7%. 
Now, that's one thing. Uh, in 2021, a collaboration of 30 organizations resulted in a report called We Also Served. It was the first holistic research uh, into ex-service women. It revealed that while some veterans remember their forces' careers with pride and flourished after leaving, female veterans are two and a half times more likely to have suicidal thoughts than civilian women. They're also more likely to be unemployed and uh, less likely to be claiming benefits. Um, also, there's a report, abused, raped, ignored how invisible female British military veterans are fighting back. Uh, they've been dismissed for years about their concerns, but this spring, the first strategy for female veterans will be published. The Office for Veteran Affairs, OVA, announced in January it's going to spend, it spent £445,000 uh, to better understand the needs of more than 235 women thousand women veterans of the army royal navy and royal air force to provide and this is the important part because we've also talked about uh, sexual abuse and domestic abuse earlier today uh to provide support for the shockingly high numbers who have experienced military sexual trauma why am i telling you all of this because that's the facts and figures this is what it actually looks like. Gemma Morgan has written a book called Pink Camouflage. Um, it's a no-holds-barred memoir describing what she went through while she was in the British Army. Uh, Gemma joins me now. Gemma, thank you so much. I kind of threw all those figures out there just to give people a background. What you, When you signed up, what did you think you were signing up for? And what was the reality? Hi, Tricia. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, when I when I signed up, I was really pulled in by this promise of brotherhood. Um, it was uh, this promise of a family united by this really powerful set of ideals. Um, things like, you know, honour, service, duty, um, selflessness, integrity. And, um, and that really pulled me in. I wanted to be part of something that had this sense of real meaning and real purpose. Um, and, and certainly at the beginning, I, I, I would say that I, I felt most of that. Um, and, and, and whilst I fitted in, um, and it was fitting in rather than belonging, it was becoming like the, the center of power. You had to become like the men that were in there to survive. Um, and in that sense, deny much of who you were, minimize who you were, particularly any femininity. Um, but but in that sense, whilst I fitted in, things went pretty well. Um, it was when I accentuated a point of difference, which for me was a mental health struggle after trauma, after an operational service, um, that the wheels started to squeak and it became really uh, uh, detrimental to my health. When you talk about operational service, what sort of can can you describe what you you witnessed where you were? Because there still is that kind of furphy that women in the army, you know, like the second Second World War, they're on the telephone exchange or they're doing you know cooking or something like that. Um, I think since what is it twenty sixteen, it's changed. Though women uh, can serve on the front line. What where, where did you serve? Can you tell us what you saw? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's a myth that women are rear echelon these days. Um, and, we, you know, we don't fight the type of linear warfare uh, that, that we fought before. So in terms of threat, it's it's everywhere. And certainly women are are heavily involved um, as are men um, across the, the battlefield. Um, I went out to uh, Kosovo in 1998. That was before NATO went out. I was part mm -hmm. of an observer mission. We were there to verify um, what was going on on the ground, which was, uh, I'm sure many people will remember, uh, it was ethnic cleansing um, and, and and latterly what was evidenced as war crimes. So I was there um, leading a multinational patrol um, to the west of Kosovo and, and collating reports, taking photos, um, rolling video cameras, really gathering evidence of the reality of what was happening on on the ground and sending it back, which essentially built the political will for NATO to then go in in 1999. But you and know, you, you talk about, you talk about taking photos and videos. So you're you're taking photos and videos of horrific scenes. I'm thinking. 
Absolutely. I think in a normal military environment, you have, you know, a forward recce that goes out to check the route safe. Um, if anything happens to you, there's a Cassivac procedure to get you out. But we were very much alone. Um, we were, uh, there was myself leading the patrol, um, the guys on the patrol with me, and you were completely self-contained and reliant on each other because there was no military machine around you. We were unarmed. We were dressed in civilian clothing. Um, so incredibly vulnerable. Um and and I would say professionally, it was exhilarating. That's probably quite a strange thing to say, maybe, but that's what you're trained for. And it, we were really tested. Um, but personally, it it was it was devastating. I was I was highly traumatized because I felt that my role as a army officer was to make a difference. Um, and yet we were paralyzed. We just stood and we watched and we collated reports whilst these horrific things were going on around us and and we knew that um but we were powerless to to do anything that i felt was really meaningful and that's really hard from a moral and value point of view um aside from what you see that there's is that's okay. very i found that very very hard to come to terms with when i came home yeah okay can you tell us what the worst situation you found yourself in and how your reaction may have differed or maybe it didn't differ from your male colleagues? Um, yeah, I'd say I, I suffered from um, various flashbacks when I came back. I had symptoms of post-traumatic stress, um, quite severe symptoms. And and there were two key flashbacks that I, that I had. One was um, when we were asked to um, go to an ambush um, and we we arrived um, as the patrol commander. I, I You go into military mode the training takes over and you don't really feel and think you it kicks in and the training the training does take over it sounds a little bit cliche but it but it happens um and yeah it, it was there's, there's the scene of that, that you have to contain and cordon off and do all the things you're meant to do um but I, the, the piece that i kept kept coming back to me was this um younger man's uh eyes actually um who was who was hanging out the car half in half out and I just it kept coming back to me at night and and the other thing that kept coming back to me was um the mother that arrived on the scene there was a crowd that had gathered and she arrived and she came under the cordon and this animal-like howl as she saw her boys in the in that vehicle and I, and I that howl just kept waking me up um again and again each night um uh it's the, it's the human emotion the human story in it that gets you were you allowed to show your feelings because you right at the beginning you said you had to become one yeah you, you had to become one of, with the family and i totally get what you're saying you had to almost imitate and become male like i, I, I a totally different situation but i was um as a female in the Australian newsrooms in the 80s, um, I had to be more of a bloke than the blokes, even when I was pregnant, um, which in itself is difficult. But my goodness, in your situation, how did that play out for you? Yeah, you had to. I, I remember as a young troop commander, if when they called you one of the lads, because you were when I was in, there was only ten percent that were women, and and certainly I was the only woman on the patrol. Um, and where we would operate, you'd often be the only woman in your regiment. Um, so so you were very much in the minority. Um, and you, when when the lads in the bar would call you one of the lads, it was like, yes, I've made it. You know, I've I've actually made it here. I'm safe. You know, you you feel safe, don't you? Um, and you think, right, well, they're not going to treat me that way. I'm not vulnerable anymore because I'm one of you. I've, I've fitted into one of you. And I think um, in order to fit in, I became like the men in terms of the language I used, in terms of even my presence, how I walked. I hid any, there was no makeup, you know, there was no, um, even the kit we wore, it was all designed and made for men. Um, so everything became very hyper-masculine in the way that we operated and there were there were very different rules on an operational tour like that for men and women so um as a woman and particularly as a female commander you 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 had to first of all obviously gain the confidence of your men um in in terms of your leadership um but if you needed to cry if you needed to exhale um however, however that was expressed um 
you had to do it away from the men. Um, and there was a, there was one other woman, a Canadian lady that that was out there with me, and we would watch each other's back. You know, it was we'd, we'd have shark watch on each other, where um, you wouldn't go out unless the other person was with you, because if you went out and the guys had been drinking, you were incredibly vulnerable. Um, so really? you'd I mean, have shark watch on each other. Did anyone went shark watch? I mean, were there instances, uh, as I said before, the fact that the government has actually recognised that? they've allocated this money to provide support for the shockingly high numbers who've experienced military sexual trauma. Were you ever in that situation where one of the troops, one of the men came on to you or tried something? Yeah, not when I was on an operational tour in Kosovo. Actually, in my patrol and the men that I was working with, I have nothing but high regard to, to say. I mean, they're multinational and they were incredible soldiers. Um, yeah. as were many of my colleagues back in the UK. And I, and I have huge, um, I feel it's a huge privilege and an honour to have served with so many incredible women and men. Um, however, um, uh, back in the UK, when I was a young troop commander, so straight out of Sandhurst, um, I was sexually assaulted by a senior soldier. Um, it's an environment where it's incredibly boozy, it's incredibly boorish, um, and it was at Christmas time, officers went to the sergeant's mess. Before the sergeants let you in the mess, you had to do an assault course, you had to down pints of, you know, beer, and, and everybody had to join in, you know, it was mandatory. And as I was leaving, a senior soldier forced me into what was a phone booth back then um, in, in the side and, and sexually assaulted me. Um, but, and you don't say anything because it wasn't safe to say anything because the chain of command would close ranks on you where it was your fault and it was fundamentally career limiting so it was very victim blaming you didn't say a word and then later on when I came back from Kosovo um I was traumatized I was struggling with post-traumatic stress um uh, I was numbing uh, self-medicating I was drinking heavily um to try and cope with uh the the illness that that I had I wasn't being treated properly for it um, and so in that self-medication stage, I made myself even more vulnerable. And yes, I was seriously um, 